What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Between Two Heads. My name is Jameson Walborn. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Addison Demora, And today we are joined by Max of Turptopia. Max, thank you so much for joining us, bro. Thanks for having me, man. I'm, I'm really excited to do this. Bro, what's, what's up, up, Max? Man? here. So before we get into the exciting work that you're doing today, as always, we like to take it back a little bit and learn a little bit about the man behind the resin. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you grew up? Uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I was there for, I would say, 12, 13 years of my life. We uh, we moved to Eastern Washington when we were homeless. So kind of grew up pretty hard, you know, uh, kind of did the figuring out life thing at an early age. And I, I kind of knew that uh, college wasn't going to be of access, you know, so I started going the cannabis route, you know, so uh, I, I started hustling when I was pretty young in high school and kind of just took me down the route of staying in cannabis and I never got out of it, you know, just kind of brought me to, to the point where I'm at. I've never left Eastern Washington. I've kind of stayed here for the last uh, 15, 16 years, you know, so. It's how, been, long, how long were you homeless for, Max? Uh, we were homeless for about a year. Um, kind of, we went through different, uh, uh, what do they call them? Uh, like, like homeless houses for families and shit, you know. Cause I had my mom and dad with me. So, uh, we did that for shit, you know, at least six months. And then we kind of bounced from friend to friend, you know, my parents were, were drug addicts at the time. So they, you know, were kind of figuring out life themselves too, you know? So, uh, as they brought us up to Eastern Washington where we had one, I had a grandma up here, you know? So that was kind of like the only like outlet we had for family. So when I came up here, it was just like, uh it was different you know because i came from a place that had culture a lot of different like things going on you know just it was it was just different a bigger city and i, I went to the you know st pretty much sticks you know like where i'm at in uh in eastern washington is like really really rural it's it's really low key there's really not much going on you know it's it's one of the biggest cities but as i would say as far as cannabis goes like we really kind of keep our head down and we kind of just grind it out you know so what were what were the <clears throat> your early experiences or what was your early perception of cannabis like like you know growing up in a household where parents have substance abuse problems sometimes the kids tend to maybe group cannabis in with all those other drugs and, and take a really negative look at it how did how did that work for you so for me I was always around cannabis so like my parents were, were also cannabis users you know but that you know my dad was in and out of jail. So it was kind of, you know, more apparent that like, he was doing more than cannabis, you know? So like it, as we got older, uh, cause I have an older brother, uh, a half brother, same mom, different dads. Uh, as we got older, me and my brother just kind of chopped it up as, you know, what they were doing was dope, you know, and what, you know, what cannabis was cannabis, you know? And, and mm -hmm. my, my parents got, it was really apparent, you know, cause they use cannabis as, as a, a, a crutch to kind of stay you know away from everything especially moving to a place they didn't know anybody where they could have went and fucked up pretty easy you know like mm -hmm. you know so like uh for me like i i never saw it as like a i need to stray away from it type of thing like i saw it as uh it was in front of me my parents were, were they didn't hide it you know like like they smoked weed in the car and shit like that you know so like i remember being a kid and like in our household, it wasn't like you were allowed just to smoke, you know, like when my parents got their shit together, it was, you know, they they had a pretty strong household, you know, like I couldn't smoke when I was uh, under 18 and shit. I did, you know, but like they, you know, I wasn't in their household fucking, <clears throat> you know, in the room next door blowing down fucking bong rips and shit, you know, <laughs> as much as I would like to, you know, and that's why I moved out. Uh, I moved out my senior year, you know, just for that reason. So I could get out and do shit like that, you know. Okay. And how, really how long did it? Oh, sorry. How go long ahead, did it ahead. take? I was just wondering more about like your parents in that situation. Um, how long did it take for them to? Because you said they eventually got their stuff together. Um, how long did that take? Was that like a a short period, or was it kind of? And what was that like? Did they did something happen? Like what was kind of that story? When we were bouncing around in Portland, like they were already trying, you know, like uh, and you can, you know, as, when it comes to to being an addict, you know, and being. Uh, going to jail you can only try so hard when you're stuck in that yeah. same circle you know so yeah they're really trying and uh i think they had really burned every bridge as far as family went because i was like my my older brother got to go and be with his dad's family you know i was stuck with my parents like you know i got i had to go through all this shit i stood in soup lines the whole night 
Like it was, you know, it definitely was, it's pretty crazy, you know? So like to see them it stuck there. And then my, my mom had a, her, her mom here, my grandma. So like, they just went for it. And as soon as we got here, they were honestly, I, you know, I didn't see any kind of, you know, drug activity that they would do like that. You know, we were on a pretty straight family. Like as soon as we got to Washington, you that's know? cool. That's good. That's good to hear. Cause it's always one of those things like I, and the reason I ask is cause I, I had sort of the same, you know, upbringing, um, not the homelessness and stuff, but definitely had, you know, my mom was, was wild and crazy and, and sort of dealt with that, but it was, uh, um, the hard drugs and all that stuff. I know that that makes it really tough. Like it makes it so hard to, to even sort of, and, and when you're a kid, you don't really know, but just for getting your shit together, you think there's not you, a lot of like functional, you know, heavy drugs. Well, you or think you know, you know, and, that, and that's the crazy yeah. part about it is like growing up is like, I thought I, I thought I had it understood that, you know, and seeing it, they were just growing up themselves, you know, like it, yeah. it's, it's trippy as it is. Like you, you don't ever think about that process, but like, you know, your parents are, you know, they're, we all grow up every day, you know, so oh. to see them get, <clears throat> It is you know it's just like a happy moment for me as an adult you know i'm like that you know they have their shit together they have i have a little brother too so it's you know they've they've okay. done great you know, they've done great in life since, you know it was just a it was a different upbringing you know like especially coming to a place where at the time uh you know this town didn't have a whole lot of uh i would say culture like there wasn't a whole lot of kids like me that uh talked with you know i got called a wigger a lot stuff like that. you know just had more like slang you know and stuff like that in their, mm -hmm. in their vocabulary at a young age too you know so like yeah. it was just weird like kids were allowed when i was in middle school to come to school with pocket knives and have two in their back pocket and shit you know like it was it was a trip you know and i went from <laughs> searched in metal detector to that you know? it was like yeah. what the fuck is that? this is a crazy difference of life you know so well, like what were the what was the first experience with cannabis like do you have a, a memory of your first interaction with the plant oh yeah so like my parents being you know smokers as it was like they always they would smoke in their bedroom to be like uh i'd say respectful to not smoke the whole house up and shit like that you know at night my dad would occasionally sit on the couch and smoke and shit like that but they would leave all their shit in their bedroom so you know i had the tons of opportunities to to Hey, I'm, I'm sick. I'm staying home for school or they'd go real quick and I'd sneak in the room, you know, rip a bong rip down or whatever. And I didn't even know what I was doing. I was scraping resin and shit before I even knew that was like what you were supposed to do. I was just like, okay, this is right here. I could throw this in the bowl and get, you know, smoke it potentially, you know, but my first time was definitely like, I remember my dad got a, uh, just had went and got a bag. He was, they were smoking. They left to go get his food and I snuck in there. I was, I want to say eighth grade. That was eighth grade summer. You know, I, I snuck in there and we just uh, took took like a handful of weed and I ended up sharing it with another homie. But uh, I smoked right there. And I remember my, my mom and dad coming home and kind of like hit head in the air, like bloodhound status, you know, like, oh, what is this? You know, you know, what's going on? Yeah. And that was the funniest part is growing up in there. Like they, I would steal cannabis from them or, or, you know, they always smoked pot. Mm -hmm. like, never had hash or anything when I was a kid, you know, like they're mainly like joint and uh, bong smokers. They smoked, you know, yeah. a little tiny bong like this tall and just rip bong rips, you know, type shit. So <laughs> it was funny. I would take, you know, their little bit of weed and they would fight with each other over it. They'd be like, Oh, you, you stole it, you know, or, and shit like that, you know? So that was a really <clears throat> looking back now, a funny thing to me because I'm like, that would suck in your head stash stolen, you know, and you don't know who's doing it. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever like tell them later on that you were the one that was causing all that trouble? Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they figured out that I was a little <laughs> menace, you know, in the household doing it, you know? And I think it, yeah. it took a while. Like even, uh, my mom was the first person to cave in. Like I was 16 and I would, I'd get my mom, uh, you know, herb and shit, you know, cause she was, she, she knew that she knew what was going on, you know, like I saw when I was 15, 16, you know, so she kind of understood what, what the, what the deal was. My dad, it took him until I was 17, 18 to kind of like come around, you know, I remember driving down the road and he all casually sets the pipe down in between us, you know, and I was like, that was the first time I ever smoked with my dad, you know? So it was, you know, cannabis with your parents. It, it's cool. Cause now as an adult, like I can really enjoy cannabis with them, you know, like yeah. looking back at it then, like, you know, they tried to run the household good, you know, like they didn't, they didn't allow us to do, uh, 
do drugs or drink or smoke or anything. Like I started smoking cigarettes when I was like 12, you know, and like, luckily I stopped doing that, at, you know, after, you know, five, six years or whatever it was, you know, but like shit, just shit, like you just start things early when you go from a, a I think a bigger a vibe to a smaller town, you know, like I was just in so exposed to so much more, you know, so and then I got to an area where I could do way more, at, like at all times. Like I wasn't afraid to walk outside at night. You know, it was, you know, like it, it, was, it was just different. You know, like I could go anywhere I wanted in this town and not feel scared because you're not going to get like fucked with by a homeless person or, you know, some random fucking, you know, some something random, you know. So like the, it just changed a lot when we came to Eastern Washington, like a lot. So what was high school like for you being being that city kid and, and now in this new environment? Like, was it hard to adjust or, or did you did it? Did it? I honestly I got friends right away, like uh, being in middle school, like I got a pretty good group of friends that like transitioned into high school. And I ended up switching high schools mid high school, like uh, like my sophomore year uh, to go to a bigger high school. And I, that's where I really, like, we, we started hustling, like me and my, my boy, I call him my brother, my, like, dude, I started this business with Tertopia, Andrew, he, he, like, uh, we just kind of developed a plan to start hustling. And that's just what we've been doing ever since, you know, like, I, I went to another school, he took the school that we had, and we just, you know, kind of did our thing, you know, so it was, uh, in high school, it was an easy transition because everybody wants to be your friend when you got, when you got bags, you know, like it's, it's, sure. it's a party gig, you know, you, you pull up to a party, you know, everyone, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fun time, you know, For so sure. like, high school was easy and I love sports too. So like, uh, I did, I played sports and shit. So like, I wasn't, I wasn't like a, a loner because I came from a different uh, city by any means or anything like that. You know, like I had tons of friends, like, out here it's it's kind of crazy because like I, I didn't get a chance to like go back to portland too much and like do things while i was in high school like i'd do it in summertime and go see family but like uh as far as friends go like i mainly like grew up with friends up, up here so like a lot of it was like in the summer bonfire parties and shit like that like they you know they're hicks you know so it's it's a yeah. different a different vibe you know big old fucking house parties and it's just you know that's what high school was you know it was uh it, uh, uh, a crazy moment, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know. What? Uh, w when did you? When did you first start cultivating? Um. So my boy Andrew, we moved out when we were se our senior year. So uh, he had actually turned eighteen, and I was still seventeen at the moment. And we got a little trailer that we had moved into, and we've been living in it for a minute. And his cousin had brought back some beans from Canada, some lemon skunk, and they popped those. And when he, my boy moved out, he set me up with just a little 1,000 little HPS in my closet, you know. We, that's I had something going at my spot. He had something going at his spot, you know. So like, I was you know 18, 17, 18, you know, like right, you know, right then and there, like, uh, and we had a. Uh, I think I can't even remember all the strains back then, but you know, lemon skunk, white widow, uh, man, there was permafrost. We had a bunch of old, you know, old strains. And I don't even know if some of these strains made it around the other markets. Like thinking back on it, like I had my room covered in high times magazines and shit. And like a lot of the strains you only saw, like I saw white widow and stuff, but like, I didn't see permafrost. I think, you know, that could have been like something more local to us, you know? Yeah you know but uh like lemon skunk i remember when we got the beans for that like when his cousin popped those and we all got clones and we were able to grow those out like i remember like that was a big deal because that was a cannabis cup winner and it was like mm -hmm. oh like you know like this is this is fucking cool you know like this is this is something that we should be proud of you know so like getting exposed to some cool strains at a i think young part of my cannabis you know like uh career was was also really good you know like i had a buddy uh when I was uh, fuck, yeah, 17 that uh, was uh, running hydrocarbon. He was one of the first, I would say, people in this area that I knew that was like really doing it, you know? And he had so many strains. He was always buying stuff out of uh, high times and just, it, it was it was a trip to see it, you know? Like I was, I was tripped out that dude was buying, you know, thousand dollars worth of seeds through a magazine, you know, <laughs> sending money orders through a magazine. And to see uh, like, I would say a library like that at a young age, like I think more or less exposed us to like want to grow different pot, you know, early mm -hmm. on. Yeah. We just, well possible. 
Yeah, we didn't just stay with the same shit. We never did, you know. Even like I want to say my first grow, I had two or three strains, you know, like under you know one lighter, you know, it was just a in a little closet. Like that was my first time that we uh, even tried to grow weed, you know, you know. So like it was, and that was different. Like every other grow that I ever went to, they only had like one strain. Yeah. You know, I go, you, you look in a field or wherever it was, you know, they had one strain or their, their basement, one strain, you know, they didn't have a library, you know? So like to, to see that, like, I think that was a big part of like trying to, to, to go harder, you know, like right off the rip, like we got to see different cannabis and we got to see it all the time. Yeah. You know? So you mentioned that you had a buddy in high school running hydrocarbon. So you were exposed to, uh concentrates clearly like at what age were you did that first introduction start oh well so we smoked hash when i was like i want to say 15 16 off a metal swing little ti swing with the the glass hood like that was the first time i ever i would say dabbed but like uh hydrocarbon extracts yeah like 17 18 like i had a buddy who was open blasting and you know they uh he actually got a uh what the fuck are those things called they used to sell them in the back of high times. It was uh honeybee. Yeah, uh, maybe it was a honey. Was, what'd you say? Is it a busy bee or a honeybee? No, no, it was, it was something that you would like run like herbs and spices with. Like it was like a super. It's the isolator extractor. Is that what it was? Like that weird one that had like the two no, no, no. down with the thing. You butane through it. You ran butane through it. It was. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah, they had it in the back, and it was like he spent like sixteen, seventeen hundred bucks on this thing, and we would run it in his kitchen. Super sketchy. It had an outlet fucking line, and you'd put it out there, and like, like the guy was older than me. He was, fuck, I want to say twenty five, twenty six when I was, you know, seventeen, eighteen. So a little older, a little bit more into it, you know. And dumbasses would be smoking cigarettes and shit in there while we're open blasting, you know, with this little. It, I can't I can't think of the life for me what it was. It was all stainless though. It was pretty cool for the time. Little tiny small thing. You could put probably yeah. a quarter, half ounce of uh, you know, trim and, and bud and larf and shit in there, you know. But I always remember it'd come out like Hershey syrup, black. Just black. We weren't purging it or nothing, just the, the darkest stuff. Uh, he'd always, when we'd run it and make it, he'd always have like the randomest containers, whether it's like an all toys container or some random shit to put it in, you know, like it was so like young, like nobody was doing this. Yeah. You couldn't go to the store and even get gear to smoke the shit. Like, you, like the, I remember the first store that had it was a Chinese shop here and they had not, like little tiny glass nails with the, the domes and shit. And that was like the first spot that had it, you know, and like you mm -hmm. explode fucking 20 nails to get you know everyone high and that was that you know like um but yeah that was that was a trip you know being young and seeing uh hydrocarbons like right away like i kind of knew that was the way right off the rip like knowing that yeah. you could take one dab and not have to smoke a <laughs> stack to be stoned was you know uh a change you know it was going to change the market yeah. so like kind of right off the rip i started uh, more or less going towards i would say the hydrocarbon or like concentrate route like early on you know like we had ex you know experienced and like messed with bubble bags and stuff when we were younger but like smoking green hash was not fun you know like, no. <laughs> i would say not smoking like dark hershey syrup bho is not fun either but you know as, <laughs> as time goes on like some things would have flavor you know like I remember the first time we even open blasted fresh frozen, you know, froze the whole tube and got like maybe a gram out of it, you know, and it, it, it was just different, you know, they, like you could see the like cannabis changing and the scene changing like right in front of my eyes. And that was, I would say cool because being where I'm at, like all I got was like the high times to look at, you know, and the internet, but the internet wasn't really too pop. And I would say with a whole lot of information, unless you were on like a, uh yeah you know some sort of group or something you know that you were talking to people yeah. about, but like, forums or something like that yeah, yeah of some sort like there really wasn't you know like a whole lot of stuff for you to like look at and really like engulf yourself into you know besides high times you know so like and like being out here like it was a very very like small community everybody grew flower like so like once dabs came around it was everybody wanted to dab you know, mm -hmm. like it, it's an open blasting was a thing. Like you have people out here who have land and 
they can do whatever they want on their land. So they just go out there and start open blasting, you know, blowing their sheds up left and right, you know. So, it, you know, I've seen my fair share of uh, open blasting setups and I've seen a, a fair share of really cool hydrocarbon setups too, you know, that are uh, phenomenal, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, like having that background, that's what we started with. You know, we started with a hydrocarbon setup, we built one from open source. Uh, we started open blasting and going into that route, you know, so like it was just, I think being exposed to dabs at an early age, I kind of strayed away from flour, like right away, you know, like yeah. besides the the needing it to, to uh, produce my extracts, you know, like I, I really like the only part that I was interested for me has been like, uh, you know, what, what flavors are we popping next, you know, cause I have, yeah. I have my boy Andrew who like does a lot for me and I have a couple other homies who do a lot for me on the growing side. So like, that's a, that's a big part of, uh, I think keeping this team alive, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, genetics are important. And I think like, I can remember back to when I switched from smoking flour to dabbing and, and it, it used to trip me out. I'd look at a jar and be like, I can't believe that. Like I put a dab on a dabber and be like, this is like fucking two joints. You know what I mean? And, and, and then you, you did away with, with the, uh, my biggest issue with flour is that, you know, it would always make everything smell and you'd always smell like flour. And then the roach would smell like something else. And then the fucking flour smelled like something. And you were just this like giant stank bomb floating around and that's highly what, detectable. You exactly. Know? That was what was so cool being young, taking dabs is you would instantly like, I could show up to work and not fucking reek, you know, like not I, reek. Yeah. You could have just taken a dab in the car, and then when you come back to your car, it doesn't smell like fucking weed. Like it was the greatest. Yeah. Look weird at me, except for the fact that I'm, you know, just blaze. You know, so it's, it is what it is. But like, you know, when it comes to the the like uh, offending other people with the smell and shit, you don't have yeah. that. You know, like well, just the detection, like like yeah. being more low key about it. Yeah, it's, well, it's like kids don't know nowadays. You know, they have vape pens, they have all this shit. They don't know what it was like. Like. Bro, just like, fucking reeking like weed all the time. You know? Well, I live 15 minutes, you know, 20 minutes from Idaho. So I live near a zero tolerance state, you know? So as far as like smoking flour goes, like we learned at a young age, like you better spray up. You take that shit out of your car. Like mm -hmm. every kid in high school had gone out there and got a minor in possession with, with weed, you know, cause it was so easy for him. They they pull them over. Oh, it smells like weed. They search the whole fucking car and search there you go. something, you know, a pipe or something, you know. So, and, and and just that smell factor, like you're saying, like you're detected. Like it's it's so every time. Yeah, it's so and especially if you're smoking some loud flour. Like if you're smoking good flour, like you know, that that shit's sticking on you. If it's some good greasy, you know that. Oh yeah, you're not getting away from that. It's on your breath, yeah. especially if you didn't drink or do anything with your breath. That shit's. You're done for. Well, even even like the uh, in terms of trapping or in terms of moving weight, it was like when it switched from flour to oil, uh, oh, yeah. you know, for it, it was well, such a fucking from, easier job. Like you go from a big amount to a small amount. Yeah, you know, it's well it's, the big the biggest issue with the oil was getting the money back because that was like your problem because getting everything there doing it is dude, I'd have TSA take fucking jars out of my bag or just slabs and be like, oh, put these aside. What's what is this bottle of juice? You're like, oh, my bad. And they fucking put the slats. It, it was, juice, yeah, when that shit was shifted. You're like, is that yeah. no, orange juice? That's a no-no. <laughs> oh, I remember them. I remember one time I had Diamond Baron, these jars of Diamond Baron. And the dude's like, what's this? And I'm like, it's a uh, face scrub. Oh. And he's like, face scrub, huh? And I'm like, yeah, it's face scrub. And he's like, okay. And he's like, well, the sheriff's going to be here in a minute. And I'm like, all right. So I'm waiting and waiting and the sheriff like is late or not coming. And the dude's finally just like, you know what, bro, I know this isn't face scrub, but I don't have time to deal with this right now. So you could just take this. And I was like, dude, it's face scrub. You could try some if you want. <laughs> Fuck you just try it. put it in my shit and bounce I, the fuck I, out. Like, either that up, bud. <laughs> yeah. I would have been tripped out if he started rubbing diamonds on his face, but Hey, well, they fucking, they're not trained for that shit, you know? And a lot of no. people, the, the average Joe thinks that those guys are Navy SEALs or something ready to take you out. And it's, they, they don't know what they're looking for. They don't even know what $10,000 looks like, you know? So, you know, like it, the chances of you getting just fucked on them being dumb is right there, you know, like, the, yeah. the, you know, so that, that's, what's also really scary with like TSA. They, they might not know what they are even looking at, you know? 
A lot of time they don't, man. There's ways to move things around that even those guys have a hard time detecting. It's like, you know, it's, and, and it's, but at the same time, their job is to look for bombs. It's not to look for the bombs, bomb. so and it's, bombs and guns and large amounts of money. Yep. Yep. Right. That's, and the large amount of money is pretty funny because technically you can fly anywhere in the U.S. with any amount of money you actually want. You just can't leave the country with more than 10,000. But anyway, asset it, forfeiture aside, let's never continue the conversation. But what they are, they get people because they don't know, you know, that, that that's the craziest part. Like, yeah. It's yeah, it's you got to knowledge is power. Well, TSA now is pretty chill. It seems like anywhere you go, I fly everywhere the same way in and out. And, it, and it's just, you know, I'm not really I don't really feel like there's nothing that I can't talk my way out of when it comes to cannabis. It's like I don't have other, you know, I don't have fucking DMT vape pens in my bag or any weird <laughs> shit like that. And I'm not in Russia, um, <laughs> but it, it seems pretty easy now to kind of get around. But so mo moving forward, um, it sounds like you're at this point, you're your guys are open blasting. You guys might be open blasting. And is that when you start Terptopia and you guys started with BHO? Um, so no, honestly, I started uh, Terptopia a little later on after that, you know, so okay. we were more. Did you guys have a brand? No. So like that was, that's the thing is where, like where I was, it's so, it was so dead, man. Like there wasn't like the market out here is just smoking, you know, like, people just smoke, you know? So like the, there was no branding. Like I was, uh, like, I want to say, fuck 20 years old when I, I started hitting different events and started really seeing what could be done with cannabis, you know, like mm -hmm. I went to, uh, Emerald, I went to, you know, uh, uh, the dope cup that they had out here way back in the day. Like, yeah. uh, I just, just random things, you know? And I want to say like, just seeing the branding in front of me, you know, and like already being a, a hustler, like I kind of knew that's where it was headed. You know, like I, I just kind of mm -hmm. like seeing it uh, put in front of me so much and seeing how I would say professional it was, you know, like our medical market in Washington, we had a couple cool, really cool brands, you know, like that were, I would say more inspirational for like starting the branding too, would, would be like, you know, refine, you know, extract oh, yeah. that, that yeah. would, they had, all their shatter and cool little jars with the strains on them. And they had all different look for each one. And you could pull up to uh, like two, two dispos in my town, but like for Washington as a whole, like you could pull up to anywhere in Seattle and you could get, you know, refine. And that was yeah. kind of the move, you know, like there really wasn't a whole lot of hash in, in dispos or, or the farmer's markets per se. Like, you know, like the, and if it was, it wasn't anything desirable, you know, like, no, I want to say the 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 best and like first hash that I was that I was really really intrigued by and it was dry sift was uh, exotic genetics Mike uh, with his CNC out here he was putting out a bunch of full melt out here way back you know ten yeah ten plus years ago you know and they would, and that was just kind of like the thing like you'd have to go uh, to dispose to kind of like get something that was worth desire, you know, like the, our medical market was strong and they shit on it. You know, when they, when they went to rec, you know, 502, they pretty much just shit the, you know, sh they took a lot of people's soul away that were in it, you know? So, yeah. and, and being out where I'm at, you know, in Eastern Washington, like a lot of these guys, like they already were kind of tired, you know? So like getting yeah. kicked down one more step, you know, was, it was even worse, you know? So, branding i i kind of saw that like at a young age knowing that that was the route you know and i branded the first time 2017 at chalice uh i came up with uh terptopia and uh it was earlier on in that year maybe even later 2016 and uh just kind of was running with it and we were starting to fuck with hash and i took our some uh first presses down there and i went to two tables and sold out you know i'm like that was i had black and white stickers manila envelopes you know like mm -hmm. you know old school style you know like like easy peasy it was you know and i remember i was so dumb i i went to a booth and i sold it for i want to say it was 50 or 60 a gram or whatever and the the kid looked at me and he he had just got done selling me hash for whatever it was like 80 or 90 dollars i had bought in like uh trichrome heavy and a couple other yep guys that i really like looked up to you know and uh i had i had pulled out some shit and i show them and it was like a cherry pie cross 
and I show him it and he was like, oh, this is you? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I'll take all of it. <laughs> and I was like, tight. So him and the table next to him, they just bought me out right there. The first 20, 30 minutes I was in the gate of Chalice, you know, so. Sold yeah. out. That's so dope. Yeah. And so like, that was really where I was like, yo, this is it. Like the branding, like, like I'm onto something like, you know, like I granted it was nothing. It was just a black and white sticker. We didn't even do anything like cool. Uh, but just having it like that and not showing up with a Tupperware or a pizza box or whatever the fuck mm -hmm. cool at the time or relevant at the time, you know, for slabs and shit like that or rosin or hash uh, was just more professional, you know, like having that, just more desired look to the consumer like it did hit me in my brain right there that i was like okay mm -hmm. you know so to follow up with that we started uh we were already producing hydrocarbons and sauce was like really getting uh popular you know so our first i would say like cool sticker jarred product was like a hydrocarbon sauce diamond mm -hmm. you know type shit you know because we didn't even have it down yet we were just like cool you know put it in the jars because that's what was popping you know that's what people were smoking you know especially like i said out where we are where there wasn't really a market you know like i was i you know still just like a lot of people using uh instagram at what's you know what's relevant in the scene you know so i was seeing what was around so we started producing the sauce you know hydrocarbon sauce and uh we packaged that we actually had a two grows come down at the same time and we took it down as some hell's fire some keebler cookies um i don't want to say like gg4 or maybe something else and that's what we took and uh just seeing it like you know packaged in front of me with the strains and the the colored stickers and everything like that was it just more more fire you know like it was just more fire mm -hmm. to keep going and doing more with it you know and uh as the market changed like we dropped and we like we don't do any hydrocarbons anymore. Like, you know, so as the market changed, we just kind of stuck with learning and, and, uh, doing more with hash, you know, like that's, uh, I was always kind of more passionate on smoking hash over the hydrocarbons. So me and my, my boy, Andrew, we'd always have little, you know, tiffs and arguments about that shit, you know? So it was kind of funny because now fast forward, you know, he, he don't even want to smoke that shit, you know? So, <laughs> so it's like, you know, he has a machine, he can go and blast whenever he wants, but you know, he don't, he's not, you know, trying to smoke slabs or, or, or diamonds or anything like that, you know? So it's, it's kind of crazy how, how the market changes and you kind of just got to go with it. You know, if you're smart, you gotta go with it and adapt and see the future, you know? And I think I've done a decent job of trying to project what's going on in the future for our brand. You know, like I just, I, we're small we're you know like a lot of people think we're this big ass brand you know and we're, we're really not it's 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 small team and we just we work and i i kind of just see what's trending and i try and go with whatever's in the market and and keep keep pushing you know for sure let's take it back a little bit and, and when was the first time you saw or heard about rosin like was it from phil at soil grown was it the video that got put out or definitely like yeah. uh, seeing uh the soil grown and like seeing uh the first like presses like seeing people do like hair straighteners and shit like like that was like all so new so like like we rushed out and either made hash or went and bought whoever had hash around at the time and tried to emulate it like right away you know so like i don't know the exact year or anything but i was doing it as these guys were you know i was piggybacking these guys definitely you know like especially and that's what washington does you know i don't give a fuck what anybody says like there you can be creative out here for sure but a lot of what we do relies on california and these bigger markets because we have to kind of piggyback on what trends you know like if it and if you don't you're kind of wasting time you know like you can do your own thing for sure like you can do your own thing but if you don't kind of do what's trending in these bigger markets you're just going to get left behind you know so uh definitely seeing rosin and seeing soil grown and seeing uh a lot of the hashers around the country start uh producing rosin was uh very inspirational to to get going you know like uh we started with the hair straightener moved into an arbor press you know so that was you know a little barber ball bearing press with two plates that i ordered from uh, mash.com you know so that you know it's it, to, to early onset of like pressing hash and like messing with hash like i said we met we made hash when we we're 15 16 years old making green pucks of bullshit you know and like 
I've always stuck on knowledge. So like seeing it change over time, I've been a big advocate in my circle to, to start producing clean hash and making better hash and stuff. So like at first, a lot of guys around us didn't see the, the significance of it. I would say, you know, like where we were going, why it was hash, you know, and stuff. But I would say a lot of those guys now, or, you know, they understand it, you know, it it makes total sense to, I think everybody, you know, like why you would want to grow for hash or produce hash in some way or some form, you know, because, uh, you know, and hydrocarbons have their, their place. A good hydrocarbon is great. You know, I, I have no problem with it. It's just selling point of telling someone that it's made with water and, and, and heat and pressure is uh, a lot better than trying to tell somebody this came out of uh, a tank of gas, you know, <laughs> you know, that we distilled and blah, 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 you know, like it's, you know, and you can make very clean hydrocarbons. I have no, like I said, there's, there's not a problem with that. It's just, when it comes down to giving your consumers and your friends a product, what do you want to give them? You know? So you worked with a lot of cured material in, in, the, in the wash bin prior to working. Early really on. You. Oh yeah. yeah. Once you made that switch to fresh frozen, did you ever look back? Did you ever try stuff no. out cured or, or was it a complete switch? And what's, that's, what's crazy. We've honestly, me and my boy, Andy, we've been talking a lot about trying to get back. And like, I talk about this with another homie of mine, like trying to like, uh, maybe start washing some, uh, cured flour because I see people doing it like Jay, the plant speaker and some of these other guys that solely rely on washing cured flour, you know, uh, doing great. And the stuff looks great. And I, I imagine, you know, a lot of the flavor and the effects that you're getting are completely different than fresh frozen, you know, like I haven't got to smoke a whole lot of cured hash that, of my knowledge, because, you know, people probably aren't honest with what they're putting on the label. But, uh, for the most part, like I would say, uh, we haven't, uh, in years messed with any cured like i i started messing with fresh frozen hydrocarbon and we never even looked back on that like i'd hardly even touch a trim run like we you know like it just didn't make sense like it for outcome of producing quality and what you want to smoke sell etc like you're just going to have shit that sits around with running uh an inferior product you know so uh, for the most part we've always stuck fresh frozen like i we have freezers full for years it's just been a thing you know that's what we do you know so uh, i would say um i want to get back to to washing cured material uh it's just it's hard man like having a dry room doing it the correct way uh i think a lot of people don't realize that you know to to have a a a, a good a good cured flower is one thing but to have you know what i think some of these people are curing and washing is is you know is bullshit you know uh but yeah I, i've seen some people wash some really nice flour that's cured and i'm like god damn you know like straight out of the turkey bag they start washing it you know so uh it, it's just I, I think for us i i want to get back to it it's just like i said we don't have a, a dry room at the moment for something like that to, to to go and pull multiple rooms and really do it you know like we would want to so i, I haven't been able to do it like that again Word. Where do you uh, where do you sit with the melt versus rosin debate? Are you uh, are you do you dip on one side more than the other, or are you an omnivore? Uh, so, I so me personally, I would say I I understand the debate the hundred percent of why you would want one over the other, why you would say one or the other. For me and for our our uh, brand, I would say we produce mainly rosin for what the market re reflects, you know? If we could, and not just that, uh, I, let me backtrack a little bit. A lot of strains do not produce full melt. And I don't, And there's so many people out here that are, uh, pro, you know, uh, packaging shit that isn't a full melt, you know, like it's just cause it's 90, 120 U first wash, you know, like as soon as that shit hits the nail, it tells it, you know, it's the judge, you know, it tells you, you know, so. I think, and, and then you see it in rosin, you see these people saying 90, 120, full melt, first press, you know, they, they could put whatever they want on the thing, but a lot of strains do not produce a full melt trichrome. They do not, they, at the end of the day, you get done. Some things do not produce that melt. Like they do not have a good melt. Like it's, you can go through any of the, the bags, like you can go 70, 90, 120, uh, 
different cultivars you can go to you know whatever like some of these strains do not produce it you know so i think for us we produce a lot of rosin based off of the strains that i've been able to go and wash you know um because i've seen great hash and i do not want to put out hash that isn't aquafina in the nail you know i want that you know you're so happy you know when you're done and i actually have some full melt that i uh washed a while ago that we're really proud of that we've been smoking on i think maybe we brought some to legends it's the the mo cookies and uh like something like that like that was the last time i released full melt you know besides gmo that i know tried and true is going to melt great and get you high every single time you know but a lot of these strains i would say are like on the stockier side or they're just not it you know i i wouldn't want to smoke them like yes they melt great or they just don't taste that good you know so and i think that's the problem with a lot of hash on the market right now is it either doesn't have the legs to keep you high or there's no flavor you know so i think that's a really good point i think that there's a lot a lot of stuff out there right now with that's lacking one or the other like i mean at what point are we putting too much weight in into the melt factor and and not considering the effect as well you know i think that that's something that needs to be understood it's like well, okay is the end all be all a clean nail and so can i achieve that and and if if when that is achieved, is that going to be the ultimate experience or did the, does the ultimate experience not align with the ultimate cleanliness? Exactly. And if you see too, another thing that I have like a, a weird problem with, with a lot of the melt on the, the, uh, I would say the market that you see is you see people post it and it looks great, but the, the table stability isn't there. So there's moisture still in that hash, you know? So like that's, a big thing like for us like i'm not going to produce a uh, melt that's out there that is going to cake up in a day because we didn't dry it properly you know like and i see a lot of that like there's a lot of improperly dried full melt or you know hash at that point i don't even want to call it full melt on the market that people think is full melt because it, it you know it smears out on the parchment form you know like it's that's it, <laughs> You know, and then day two, they look at it and it's fucking crumbly. Like, that's not that's not right. You know, that's not going to happen from a properly dried hash, you know. So I think that's another big thing for for the melt versus rosin thing. Like for me, like uh, like I love uh, full melt hash. Like if if we're producing good hash, like I definitely keep some in my freezer. I smoke it. I try and uh, uh, package it for for people you know that want it you know but for the most part a lot of what we produce is rosin because of what the market reflects you know do you what are your thoughts on air dried resin versus freeze dried resin i you- so we are cold as fuck where we are bro so like in the winter to fall which is i would say nine months out of the year it's that's we're air dry central you know so we are going to get into that this year. That was a big goal for our brand is to start air drying and start microplaning and start messing around with that. Because I, I personally enjoy smoking air dried full melt a little bit more than uh, freeze dried full melt. I would say I, I just, the, the heads melt a little nicer. It's just a, it's just a different, it's a different feel, different texture, you know? And I would say that then again, some strains are not allowing gonna allow you to air dry them you know they're not gonna allow you to sit there and play with them uh like that you know so i think the the ability to have the freeze dryer right there for r d on some strains because we get a lot of new stuff like i have a small team but everybody pops shit like we're always popping stuff so the last thing that i want to do is gear up and ruin someone's crop because i wanted to air dry it all you know and 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 have grease and bullshit everywhere you know like that's the i want to do so having a freeze dryer just the ease the easiness right there you know the to be able to produce runs for these guys is is nice you know that that's that's where we're at i would say for it you know but uh as far as like small smaller runs go in the future we're going to do a lot of air drying microplaning runs so yeah so in 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 a perfect world you would prefer air dried resin over freeze dried resin is that is that a fair statement uh, for the most part, like, do you, do you feel that properly air dried resin overall is a, a 
more quality that's, offering. It's a hard one, you know. Like uh, I know, I'm trying. I'm trying to paint you into a corner. I'm just. I'm, I'm I, out. I see. It, I see it, bro. I see it. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard one, you know. I would say, uh, for me personally, if I'm gonna smoke full mill, it, from my experiences, not I'm not talking about anybody else's experiences. My, my experiences, the best melt that I've seen has been air dried. Um, some of the best flavored full melt, I would say, has been uh, freeze dried. You know, like uh, as far as like, wow, that was. Fu- you know, just you're eating it, you know, like it was, was freeze dried full melt. So I would say if I'm looking for the melt content, you know, like, wow, that was great. That was easy to dab. I'll dab more of it smooth, you know, all that air dried hundred percent. But as far as, you know, like, uh, like I said, like that, some, some flavors, man, like I've had freeze dried hash, like full melt that just, I, I have not gotten air dried, you know, and I, I think that's mainly based off the strains people are air drying, you know, cause you're not going to, to microplane all some of these strains. I'm telling you right now, you're not going to have fun, you know, like, especially in your environment, you know, like it's, it's all environment based. I would say, you know, like some people, like I see a guy on Instagram, his name's like Minnesota dabs. Uh, he does like a, a plum cross and shit like that. Like, like those guys, like it's cold out there. Like, you know, like the, it's cold all the time. So doing, you know, getting to play with like shit like that, he's probably a little bit more able to, to air dry and play like that, you know? So like, that's why I, I, I even brought it up is like nine, we have nine months of cold weather. So I just want to do it as like a, as a more, uh, uh, hobbyist thing you know something to do like that's fun for us you know like yeah. you know like it, hash has got to be fun cannabis has got to be fun at the end of the day that's why we like to produce flavor that's why we're always popping different flavors because if you were to just grow one thing you're gonna be so bored man like and do one thing you're gonna be bored like that's why for a while we did hydrocarbon and hash because it was just it was fun like it was fun to have a representation of uh your homie's favorite cultivar in in hash rosin and diamonds you know that was really cool to to give people you know like that's that was a cool experience you know so like for us it's 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 trying to have fun and and be smart and and still produce cool shit you know do you you mentioned uh microplaning a couple times do you also sieve or do you prefer microplaning I don't, like so some of the strains you can definitely get away with with wet sieving or cold sieving you know but i would you know as far as like what we've done i i've microplaned a lot more than than uh wet sieved and shit like that just based off of the environment that we have set up you know and our room now i would say is going to be great for for wet sieving uh and doing all, all that you know so like i'm really excited to do more air drying this year uh and just getting back to to different styles of hashing you know because we've been so stuck with just using the the harvest right that like we haven't even played in a while you know like i feel like a big part of hashing sometimes is playing yeah what what do you guys typically run your shelf temperatures at uh 50 degrees 40 to 50 degrees yeah i think there's a lot of guys like playing with lowering that shelf temperature and finding that sweet spot between you know what's viable commercially and and what makes sense and that's the thing it's all about your your size of your runs you know most of, we tr- we try to fill our trays so like 40 to 50 degrees gets us a a a dried product in a reasonable time you know that's yeah. not taking it, you know so um I, we've definitely we've rocked it colder we've got we've gotten down to the tens 20 some strains i would say like i want to eventually you know like like we're like i said we're small man if i had more freeze dryers uh more time obviously uh i would set up each one at its own parameters for for each run you know like honestly because some of these strains we've got to do a few times now so it's it's not just uh plug and play as far as you know we're just gonna fill everything we do sometimes but like sometimes you know like like the karate kid we just ran that shit's so greasy you want to rock it a little lower like you know that especially being hotter outside where we're at too our room's struggling a little bit uh to get as cold as it normally does in the winter you know because we're in a high desert it's like a high desert wasteland they call it or some bullshit so we're getting up to that mid 90 90 degrees so you know to keep the the cold room cold is an extra step you know like yeah to keep everything going you know so i would say like some of these strains like 
totally like rocking uh, lower shelf temps and playing with your dry times is everything. And that's what I was talking about with producing full melt that has moisture in it. There's a lot of that out there right now because some of these guys are, are staying so low in their temperatures and then they're pulling them out. And yes, you can, you know, sieve through, but there's clearly moisture. You can, you know, like I do it, you know, we do it all the time where you, you get done and you can see it, you know, there's, there's moisture still present in the hash, you know? So it's, it's, mm -hmm you got to run another batch real quick and dry it longer, you know, and that's, no one wants to do that. So like for us, a lot of the parameters have been that 40, 50 degrees, you know, on, on the freeze dryer. 100%. Are you seeing popularity in fresh press the same way that where it's being showcased in the California market in your market? <sighs> I'm So that's, that's, what's crazy is like where I'm at is slow. You know, so I don't reflect my market too hard, like Eastern Washington. Like, I more or less, this is where we reside, and I work off of the other markets, you know. So, I like I said, I try and do things that uh, reflect what's going on in those markets and try and there. Like, I honestly just packaged the other day some fresh press because I've been seeing what you just said. You know, it's getting, people are wanting to do that more. They want fresh press. They want to cure it themselves or they want the ability to just to smoke these, these strains in fresh press. And that's what I, I was talking about having the different forms. Like that's cool. Like having a cold cure, having a fresh press of all these strains, when you have the same strain in front of you, it, it showcases that strain to its fullest. So for, for us, like, uh, having um to produce fresh press is like i would say still another like run dependent thing like some things you press you can instantly see that they want to nucleate and butter out like i wouldn't want to give that to somebody in a jar as a fresh press so i obviously will cold cure those you know so um for us we're just going to keep doing what makes sense you know like for the fresh press thing like i'm only going to Produ like produce fresh press that's stable nice really nice fresh press you know like uh, the, a lot like i said some of them strains you can instantly see it that thca is so active it is it's right there it's it's sugary you know like giving that somebody as a fresh press you know just knowing it's going to change right away it's just I, I, you know so i think we're going to see a lot of that again we're going to see a lot of biscuit that dry biscuit rosin on the market and people will want cold cure again you know so because people, they are abusive with their hash. They get in the car with five fucking jars and they, they forget about it. And then they're at a homie's house and they get back out, you know. And next thing you know, it's not fresh press anymore, you know. Like, no. like that's the, the shittiest thing about, I would say, a lot of fresh press, depending on the strain, is its shelf life of being a stable fresh press, you know. So, um I think the the market's always in need of different, uh, uh, I would say, textures or whatever it is, you know, uh, s different substances. Like, they're, the, they're always going to be into something new, you know, and especially right now with hash being so, <laughs> like, people are just circling back to what's old, you know, so, like, yeah. it, there's nothing new. So, they're like, cool, let's get back to what we know, fresh press, you know, so it's okay. it, it's kind of funny how it works but that's i feel like that's kind of what any market does you know any industry does you know when there's nothing new they circle back to what's old yeah, yeah they bring it back bring bring back some nostalgic shit and and, and people like it it's it's yeah. cycles you know everything's in cycles and it's going to be i think it's going to continue to be that way as you see different equipment come on board and things can be advanced in different ways and you know, you think things will progress always, but at the same time, I think that, um, I think nevertheless, you're always going it, to, it's always, it's always like regional too, right? Like, you know, that there's certain groups of people that have a shitload of popularity in their region and they may like one thing and everyone just sort of starts following in that direction too. So it's like, or, or someone's creating a lot of hype around it. I mean, that's yeah. what I love about humans. What, 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 who's gassing what up exactly? Like, you know, that's, yeah. that's, a, big, that's a big part of it. Yeah, they, some someone you know, because like even in, like interestingly enough, a very popular person may get onto something, and uh, and and make it more popular. It's like you know, burner is dabbing now, so you see burner starting to expose Darby and other glass blowers to his, Marcus. his his uh, fans and stuff, and that opens doors, you know. And that now that burner's dabbing, I think you may see more people that weren't. 
because people want to be in line with what the, the people are, the people that they look up to are doing too. So very fatty. Some of the, some of the uh, cannabis market is, it's very trendy and fatty. Super. And that's, that's what I was saying is like staying on top of that has been a big part for us <clears> to stay on those little weird trends and fads, because if you don't at least try it, it you don't know what's going to stick around. You really don't. You like it, it, So it's, it's weird as it is. Like, we're seeing uh, a lot of strains circle back around that. I, I feel like, like you're saying, weren't popular in some markets, and now people are growing them out, and now they're popular in that mar- that that circle, or and these people are gassing these certain strains up that it, people have already ran through in other markets, you know. So it's it's so weird how some of these things get uh, circled back around to, you know, because we're kind of twiddling our thumbs to waiting on what's new it's like like you're saying as far as equipment or you know whatever you know like we're we're all just kind of waiting you know like whether you're creating or you're waiting you're you're doing one of the two you know <laughs> yeah that's good yeah I, I i definitely think it's cyclical i think you're seeing a resurgence of uh narrow leaf equatorials and and guys saying oh well, we're bringing back the piff and we're working it into our lines or we're bringing back um uh, the Cuban black haze. Um, you're seeing a lot of that. these a lot days. Of, a lot of haze. A lot of haze. Um, I wanted to ask about resin mixing. We're seeing it become like really prevalent. A number of winners, including legends and Ego clash. Um, the most recent legends and Ego clash were blends. Is this something that you're, uh, actively participating in with Terpropia or what are your thoughts on it? I, uh, right next to me. They have a big, uh, big jar of Karate Kid Straw Guava that is a mix wash. Um, we, yeah, we, we do tons of mix washes. Uh, the, for us, uh, the mix, mix washing uh, provides an ability to, one, produce a different flavor, and two, not still have that. If you're, if you're sick and tired of GMO, you, you sure shit, you know, have some of it growing, so you still want to mix wash it. You want to do something else with it, you know? So, <laughs> To be able to provide that ability to like still produce something that is desirable, you know, is nice with the mix wash. And yeah. I think like what it comes down to, I was told something a, a long time ago uh, by a guy that was from the wine industry, and he he compared cannabis to wine and and where we were headed. And like you don't see, uh, you know, some of these really really beautiful wines being crafted from one one kind of grape. You know, it's so like that's that's really what it comes down to. And if we're stuck smoking one kind of strain, you know, because we want to be whatever, uh, I don't even know what the word would be. Uh, uh, you know, just whatever it is, you know, just you just want to smoke that strain, you know, and not mix. Because I've been seeing a lot of like uh, people dissing it, like, you know, mix washing, you know, they're like saying it's inferior. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I just that makes no it's the most asinine thing to me to like hear that because i'm like that makes no sense i'm like it's the same no. the same shit that we grew out the same everything there's nothing different about it we just mixed it because we wanted to create something new uh well, was, well technically it's compounding i mean that's what you're doing is taking two separates putting them together and then creating a third brand new offering like something that's unique of, of each of them and and what I think is interesting is you're seeing guys go from, you know, just two things being compounded to like a four strains being compounded, three strains being compounded at different amounts too, you know? And, but if you think about it, it's like being a chef, you know, like you guys are, you guys have ingredients that happen to all be of of the same type, but you know, you can create different things from it. So I think a lot of people don't realize that not all these strains dump. Some of them have great flavor, though. So what's going on in that consumers don't understand is, is we're using some of these strains as a carrier strain for the for the terps yeah. that they provide. You know, so some of these strains will will provide the best terps. You know, like and mixed with something else, it might create a little bit different of a terp, but it's mm-hmm. so desired that you're not going to be able to ever taste it. You like unless we do mix wash it, you're not going to be able to get the little fucking two ounces that are produced if we don't mix wash it with something else because it gets ran off you know like so like be, having these some of these strains as a carrier strain is awesome you know like yeah. i talked to 
uh, Jay, Professor Sift, when I was actually at your house about this, a lot about it, you know, and like, yeah. I thought it was something that a lot of guys uh, weren't really doing. Like, he, he's telling me he's keeping one to two percenters. And like, for us, like, I thought that was a no, no, you know, like, I thought I was supposed to find, you know, something that was still, you know, maybe of that gene mock up, but like, something that produced a better yield, you know, but he's telling me like, yo, flat out, like we've ran, you know, whatever, 50 uh, different phenos or different uh, seeds or whatever they've done. And it's still the same bang out. It's going to be one to 2%, but we got to have that flavor, you know, yeah, so they want people, that profile. Yeah. <laughs> like they they got to, you know, so it, it made a lot of sense, you know, like learning that from him, you know, like to, to be like, cool, like we can go ahead and now like kind of keep some of these ones that we were kind of like, oh, let's not keep it just because we like to smoke it because there's a lot, every hasher has shit that we're not producing out there because it didn't, it didn't dump, you know, like yeah. we'll, we'll end up smoking it to a friend or whatever it may be. Um, but a lot of them are, are flat out just, they don't, they don't prov provide a yield and there's the, the flavor is desirable. So like, being able to to produce that with a strain that does provide a yield is is everything, you know. So I think like you're saying, as people get better at it and they they add maybe five, six, you know, or whatever it is, or the the, the two perfect fucking you know strains that blend together, <laughs> strains, you know. I think that's where it's going to become really cool. There's definitely mixed washes you don't want to smoke, like I, you know, that, that's hash period. There's there's yeah. hash everywhere you don't want to smoke there's and that's because we are all picky in our own ways you know like there's there's hash that i don't like to smoke that we produce because that's the not my profile you know like but that doesn't mean it's bad hash you know so i think a lot of people get so quick to jump on the internet and call something bad without really like explaining themselves and then people just run with the shit you know like so like the the wash being bad or inferior i think that's just like so blown out of proportion like people don't understand that you know yeah, what those people don't know is that no one cares what they think anyway yeah are you, you know? are you a, are you a proponent of um mixing the material in the wash bin for any specific reason or in an ideal world would you have those two separate varietals washed separately and then the rosins mixed together so us personally, we just make the flour in the wash bin. That's how we do it. I have also used like our automated, uh, we have like, you know, uh, six cubic foot washers that we'll run. And we'll, we've done those where uh, the, they're separate, you know, each one's its own separate. But I really don't see a difference. Like you don't see much of a difference, I feel like, you know, like as far as what you're going to get final outcome, if you're keeping it separate or not, you know, I, I would say it would, it, it would take a lot of R&D in testing it for, for people, or for somebody to say there was a difference, you know, I, I, me personally, I haven't seen a difference, you know, as far as flavor goes, they come out the same. You know, uh, we stopped using a lot of our automated washers just because they're nasty. I, I, it's cleaning them and doing all that shit is fucking gross, man. Like, so we just stick to doing open washing. We we hand wash everything for now until I can uh, afford one of these nice stainless ones that you can keep really clean. You know, I just don't, not really into the the plastic components anymore. Like, besides, yeah. we use you know, we use uh, uh, fucking can of brutes and shit, but uh we you know as far as like having a bunch of uh plastic tubing and plastic components of these these automated washers that are the old school style ones like i'm just I, it just got kind of gross you know like you, you can clean as much as you want but there's so many nooks and crannies in those things like it's, have, you, have you taken a look at any of the newer equipment the axis the icon the the yeah. hash tech or things like that those are awesome. Like, you know, eventually we definitely want to get into something like, you know, a nice stainless setup like that. But dude, like just looking at what you're producing and the pricing and everything like that, like it's just a, it's a big step up for what we produce as far as our market goes and stuff, you know, like if that makes sense, like it, a lot of people don't realize you you step up into a different uh, class, I would say, and you, you make less more stress. You know, so staying in a certain ballpark of where we're at, you know, like I get to have fun. I don't stress too hard. You know, I've, I've bit off more than I can chew. I've done that, you know, so it's, 
it's one of those things like to feed a monster like an osprey or one of those you better believe you better have the the market and you better have the material to feed those things because there's a lot of dumb buying those right now like it's not that we don't have the money to go and buy something like that i just am smarter than that like i'm not gonna go buy some twenty thousand dollar thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment and and try and feed this beast and have hash for days filling up the freezers like we know what we produce uh you know and we know what we can get done in work weeks you know so it's it it is what you know well i wish more people thought that way because what they don't understand is when you do that it's a form of greed because you put more product on the market and you ultimately have to lower your price, which yep. is a race to the bottom. Yep. And that's, you know, like bringing it back to the conversation we were just previously having about, you know, what's the future of this? And you were talking about like, you're either waiting or you're, you know, it, the, I think what the future of this is, is the direction of, of wine. And it is going to be blends and they're going to be blends of different percentages and different, you know, cultivars being involved. And that's because right. like the point that, that Jay makes is if you, you don't want to throw away a 1.2 or even a 0.8 because if that 0.8 is just the right ingredient that makes your other two two point mix perfect and that's where people should be spending their time because if if you don't go get the osprey and you do mess around and tinker in and and build these things you can create a really unique menu and that's and you can use the same ingredients but but create a crazy menu and think of it as like food trucks where you know, or, or like uh, the, the chef shows where they have all the same ingredients and then you got to go make a different meal. And it's right. that, that's where I think like the, the future of this whole thing is if you if you want to get everyone's fucking attention, you create unique things that other people have never had before by taking what's out in front of everybody and putting them together in a different way. And that's like True. I want to see more of that and I want to see less of the dude, let's fucking, you know, instead of buying some Gucci belts this month let's go fucking buy this Osprey and then let's put, produce so much fucking hash that then we have to start shipping here and start doing that. You get vulnerable and you get, and you're getting messy and you fuck up the whole market for everybody. And then you end up probably, you know, not being free. So it's not smart. Exactly. Well, and for us, dude, like uh, it it kind of results back to hydrocarbons. Like my boy, Andy ran the, our, our, uh, a fucking closed loop for a while and it was boring you know like to watch that like that is boring that is a soulless boring position like you're doing, doing nothing. this yeah so like that's all these things are you're doing nothing yes you're prepping and doing stuff in the and behind the scenes in the background while you can, you can always be doing something but you're doing nothing you know so like for a work like you know for a work day like to be able to hand wash man like fuck like yes people i I see people bitching about their backs but like we just get shit done dude like we like like we just go and we bang shit out we just get it done like that's that's what that's what work is that's you know what's what we're we're meant to do is work you know so like you know as far as like hand washing goes like i i feel like it makes a way happier funner time for for more and they're like we're bullshit fun washing you know like if we're, well, then you get some, sh- you're like, oh, you know, like your shoulders are getting jacked. Like, you start looking, like, we're well, not like looking at a machine, bro. Like, like that shit is boring. Like, w- watching the machine, fucking, <laughs> it's like, okay, what? Like, you know, the thing yeah, just, and then like, well, there's know? a social component to making the hash, and there's a social component to like, a bit of love, bro. Fucking around and having fun, and whatever music's on the, on the radio or something, too, you know, so. No, I feel I feel like the the soullessness of of automation is there, man. Like and to be able to just push buttons, start and 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 provide like the Hashatron setups and some of these big wild machines that you know, uh, what's the Whitewater Hash or whatever the other big one? I can't remember the other big Whistler one. Tech. Whistler Tech, yeah, there you go. That like those they're cool. Don't get me wrong, those are fucking cool. I think the technology is cool. I think all of it's really cool. I, I just for what I am as a connoisseur and a consumer and a hasher, I just, I'd rather have fun with this shit, man. I got one life. I'm trying to have fun. I'm not trying to watch a machine do all the work. Like, yeah, I'd rather have some fun with it, see what each strain provides for us so I can give feedback to these guys the right way. Like, that's 90% of the battle. If you don't know how these strains work and how they, what they're doing and shit, like, you're not going to help these guys at all. Like, you know, I get... I, I, you know, you tell some of these guys the percentage sway and they almost kind of laugh at you, but that's their fault. Yeah. You know, like, so like 
when you have a room that sways one percent that's it's not my fault that's the guy who's growing it you know so like i get to know all that you know based off of playing with a lot of this yes you can with the big automated setup too but it's more hands-on like, like this you know hand washing playing with it way more hands-on like we we see see everything to to a t you know yeah so with, with that being said i mean would it would you say that there is a ceiling to the quality that can be produced out of a, a commercial solventless machine versus someone hand paddling a wash i wouldn't know if there's a ceiling per se because the it, there's always going to be new machines and technology made you know so like tomorrow or right now bro like there could be a guy that just shits on whatever i tell you <laughs> you know and like has a machine <laughs> Like, yo, look at this, you know, and it's, yeah. I couldn't say, you know, like, uh, I would say right now, hand washing is beating out a commercial setup 100%, you know, or it's just, you, it's, you're having, it's like a watchmaker, you know, if you have one guy working on the watch the whole time, and it's not getting passed off to a machine or 20 other hands, like, the, that watch is probably going to come out okay, you know, like, yeah. it's, it's just different, you know, like, that automotive, like having someone else do the work for you, like there's some blame to be there, you know, like if something else happens, like who else is there to blame, you know, like, so for that's for us, like, I feel like that's a big part of it too. Like being in charge of what's going on and knowing like if something doesn't go as planned, it's your fault. You know, like it's not, I don't get to yell at this $40,000 washer machine's fault, you know, like. No, and that's, I think if you're a maker, what you need to ask yourself is what's the demand for your product? Oh, if you yeah. have a huge demand for your product, you're going to need to automate and possibly, you know, add automation, but then also be doing smaller batches. Like I, I know we're going to get to a point where some of these bigger companies that are running these bigger machines, they could literally start to do hand wash in addition and sell that as a, another line. Oh yeah. You well, know, because that's happening, you know, cause they have, yeah. to, they have to, there's so much material that they've bit off yep. like a, like I was saying, you get to that next class and it's, you got to do everything you can do because you have yeah. some material. It's everything you can do to produce whatever you can do, you know? So every line counts, you know? So they, you're a hundred percent, you know, like when they get to that point, they're going to have to start dropping new lines, you know, their boutique hand wash lines and these other random lines that sell fresh press lines, whatever it is, because they have so much material and it's become you know, unless you're like a, I would say a licensed company, like that's just fucking ridiculous. Like that's overkill. If you're getting to the point where you're having multiple offsprays running and, and all that shit, like that's, you know, th those guys that are doing that are selling their hash for 20, $25 a gram, you know, less 10, $15 a gram wholesale. You know, if you're, mm -hmm. you know, whatever market you're in, you know, Washington's terrible. Like I want to say 502 is anywhere between 10 to 25, 30, if you're a really good brand, you know? Mm -hmm. you know so like it's it's I, you know and like I and think is that retail or wholesale that's wholesale so like retail the companies and the stores get you know anywhere from like if it's a good company 60 to 80 i would say you know like then you got Oregon's market's a little different you know Oregon has a shit ton of hash that's in their market so those guys are racing to the bottom right now you know so Washington will do it too Washington loves the race to the bottom they're the 502 they they it's sad as it is like these guys don't know how to coexist to save their lives in this market so they will eventually one of them will start selling it for cheaper vice versa you know so let's start mm -hmm. you know we have big yeah. like fat panda and shit that they're ready to race to the bottom. You know, that, that's, that's what he's hoping for. That's their know? model. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, let's race boy. <laughs> we like, we, can, we could lose here. money for 10 years and we'll still fucking be here. Like, yeah, we got but this. that's, you know, that's a strategy for, that's a strategy to talk to, uh, to enter a market where, you know, I think like when you, when you're talking about uh, this question of like larger equipment or smaller or, you know, it really comes down to like, what does your, what is the demand for your product? Is it there? And, and are people really need it? So you have to go to large, but you know, it, when I, when I've seen is the larger setups, uh, some of the bigger ones. And I feel like uh, it depends on the strain. It depends on everything. It's like, I've had some really good hash, uh, you know, that, that comes from the bigger, from large scale machines. And, and I've had really good hash from, you know, obviously from smaller, but I, if I had to answer, I, I would agree with you and say that the, the, 
you know, the open wash is going to kick the shit out of the other stuff. So it's just, yeah, I, th- I feel like just the neglectfulness of being able to walk away from machine is there. And like having that, like I said, that ability to say like, it wasn't my fault is there too, you know, with like the machine, like, like, uh, uh, James Nass, he, 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 uh, like wh- wh- where you know are these machines better than hand washing you know like it's so hard to say you know because what machine is better than the other one like that all comes down to r d testing and you know all these machines do different parameters it's all different you know so i feel like yeah. it, it also it all comes back to what you're saying like if you have a market for it gear up go for it you know but a lot of people are doing this and they don't realize what market they're gearing up for. If you're ready to be at the bottom and race right there, go ahead. You know, like there's, it's a sh- short little circle down there because the people with real money like that are, they'll sink you, you know? So like, yeah, I think that the, the more you like some of these guys focus on being boutique brands and wanting to hold that space in the market, the better off they are, you know, like, and that's true where we're focused at is like, I I could care less about being the biggest, baddest brand. Like I just want to be relevant in 10 years. You know, I still want to be a brand in 10 years. Like, like I don't want to fall out like half these other fucking brands are, you know? And and you see that all the time because people want to start thinking they're Budweiser and compete. And it's, it's not there. You can't do that. It's not a fun place. You know, I mean, the question that needs to be asked is, does it make hash better? Does this process make hash better? Does automating larger make hash better? Does it make a better product? Because that's what everyone should be striving to do. But you know how it is. Some guys aren't striving to make a better product. They're striving to make more fucking money. Yeah. And that's all that matters, you know, so. Bro, like, and that's the thing. I've, I've been broke my whole life. I'm comfortable being broke. I don't, you know. So what I, the question that I have for you is, as somebody who's looked at a lot of different material, have you been able to make any uh, correlation between salt grown and organically grown resin? So this is a a big one, I I would say right now. Uh, I would say between salt grown and organically grown resin, no. But I would say between indoor and outdoor resin, yes. You know, 100%. Uh, Whether it's full term, uh, hoop house or not, like, uh, Mm -hmm. I definitely can see that in the resin. Uh, You know, I would say flavor, yes. You're going to see a difference in flavor with some of these different... uh, inputs that people are using and i would say is for us that we've seen i've seen k and f gardens and stuff produce uh flavors that were less designed like you know fishy flavors and shit like that from their beds you know there's some things you you know running different styles you know people don't realize that you you know with a k and f garden you're not flushing you know so like with shit like that like you a lot of people don't realize that you're just hanging out with a lot of those inputs so if you do too much of one thing it may come back into your your result that balance yeah the balance has to be so per you have to do it correctly and do it the right way otherwise so and like there's there's so much that we've seen you know that can affect the resin you know or as far as like flavor or color etc you know so uh, I would say, you know, like salt versus uh, organic inputs. I have like me personally, I can't I wouldn't be able to look at something and tell you like right off the rip, like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I could tell you that this bottle newts definitely is how pumped it was, you know, but like as far as mm-hmm. PGR. Yeah, you know, you know, shit like that. But like you're not like it, it's it's going to be pretty like I, I would you, you could, we'd have to Pepsi challenge that for some people because I think people are talking out their ass. You yeah, know, I, I think the the outdoor the point about outdoor and what people don't realize is that when you're, when you're doing separation like this, it's so detailed that you can tell, yeah. I mean, they don't realize that the environment beats up resin and yeah. it degradates it, you know? So it's environmental, you know, shit happens. That's why indoor runs so beautiful sometimes. Cause you're like, Oh, this shit fucking lives at the spa compared well, to some you know, sh- the outdoor that's in, in the elements. So. And so- Grains do for like for us that we've seen like we don't do anything outdoors uh i've in the past we've done some depths and stuff because we've just played and had some fun you know but for the most part you can't it's too fucking cold bro like we don't have weather like you're just gonna 
and there's no one doing it so you're just sticking out like a fucking idiot you know like have have a bunch of plants outside you know like there's people who do it but it's real small you know so for us to run a lot of that kind of material like we saw like right off the rip like some strains do a lot better outside than they do inside as far as yield goes like we had like skittles for instance like the pheno that we had was dog shit inside you grow that bitch in a hoop or outside or anything like that did amazing it yielded great like everything you know so i think there's a fine balance of what you need to grow and uh, and what you're doing between both of those you know because a lot of these strains are bred outside they're not bred inside they're not you know so the the numbers and testing that are coming back are out all from outside grows it's not from an indoor grow so uh, for people like me who bring these seeds that we buy from a lot of these producers, breeders, uh, the numbers don't add up. They're not the same. You know, the numbers for, for what they're producing resin or, or yield is not the same outside to inside. You know, so it doesn't even like you, you want to get back to salt and, and organic like that. You know, that's a whole nother thing. Like if you're going to sit there and hit something with a bunch of bottled nudes, you can pump something up hella big, you know. So it's okay. it, it's just... I think that like for us, if like if for me personally looking at material, like I, I wouldn't be able to tell you right off the rip if it was, you know, unless it was blatantly obvious, like, you know, salt or organic. No. Like it, I think a lot of people are just so caught in their ways of wanting to be right and wrong. They're like, oh, organic's the right way, you know, or, you know, so I, I it, it's hard to say. I, I would say as long as you are, flushing your inputs you know properly and and doing getting proper runoff and shit like that like a lot of that stuff doesn't matter you know and if you don't know the nail will tell you just yeah. final job fucking dab of it man. And <laughs> right there you know the, the the nail in your lungs <laughs> yeah that's that's it i mean that's kind of the final judge every time is like if you're doing if you change something or tweak something and you're or trying to cut corners so you have to do x it's okay when you're done just try that shit man you know you should be trying every product you put out anyway and and, And for like getting back to the salt and the organic like for like my circle i would say it's mainly uh salt inputs uh like we have a lot of mills uh there's an athena garden um uh we do have a couple like i said homies that do run organic inputs and stuff like that so it's Mm -hmm. it's so hard to say like depending on what crop I'm running or what strain we're running. Like I personally, like the only thing I, I would be able to tell you is yield uh, between, you know, the gardens, you know, and like, like that's usually depending on how good uh, they're maintaining their garden and a number of other things, how big their garden is and shit like that, you know? So like, mm-hmm. it, and it could be just a different genotype inside the phenotype, you know? So like, there's a lot that goes into, yield uh, i would say but like looking at quality salt versus uh organic it's that's before we jump into what you have going on in your gardens that you're working with what are three of the most standout varieties from other people in the last year say that, that you've been able to experience um in in rosin or milk Ooh. The last year or so, uh, I would say one of them right off the bat would be uh, Burko's entry to Legends. He showed up last second. That shit was amazing. It was like, well, you know what it was? It was Straw peach? Nana. Was it Straw Nana? It Straw Nana. Yeah. I thought he said it was Peach Smoothie or some, something stupid like that. No, it was Straw Nana. Was his, uh, his entry was Straw Nana. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, so... <laughs> Yo, so you know uh that was you know one, like burko's entry was was amazing that shit was fire uh, oh, that shit was fire yeah, the smoothie super- was um who the fuck's was that someone else had like someone else he might have had that with him like brought some with him or something or, or that, that could, I, I can't i could have sworn because it was not it didn't taste like normal straw nana no it was straw nana what? i remember that, he told me that's yeah. why that's I have it on the list, yeah. Yeah, because I just remember it was unlabeled. He didn't have a label or nothing on it. He just showed up with it. I, yeah. was, the, I was like, Damn. Oh, he had no label. He had no labels. He, was like, yeah. he dropped his entry off. Like, he's like, what's up, bro? Like, I, you know, he's, he's so funny. Like, he's such a, uh, 
you know, he's that, up in the hills, man. He's doing so much shit. So Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh I smoked uh man, what was it? Uh something that Dr. Vert had that was a uh, like a sour of some sort that was really fucking good. Uh yeah. I recently had DFO that I really, really liked. Um I smoked some of the shit out of Maine, those Helios guys. Uh all of their flavors that I've tried all been bangers. Uh guava something, cushman's, that's everything mm-hmm. that I've tried. Full melt, their their raws and all of it's been good. Um Fuck, man. Uh, Auti, you know, all of his... Uh, anytime I get to try his stuff, like, at DFO, mm-hmm. I got to try a bunch of different shit. A bunch of the people came up, you know, from different states, so that's always fun to get to try different, you know, everyone's shit. That's uh, a great event, man. That's, like, one of the best events for that, for sure. Yeah, it's a cool... Well, and it, it's more like, like this, you know, like, you're going to get together, you're going to smoke. It's more of a sesh-based oriented... Some, you know, you're not... It's not ego-stroking unless, like, you're going after the pipes to ego stroke you know there's definitely the kids doing that you know like if you got a heady you're getting your little ego stroked on but like uh as far as like the hash goes like i think people are more or less just kind of hanging out smoking this year so like getting to try some different like i always get to try the local guys in portland so that's really cool for me because that's that's kind of like my stomping grounds down there so like i get it i love to a lot, all the guys kill it down there all the hash down there is fucking awesome so to see different hash come into that circle was pretty cool. Like to see DFO, you know, like there's people I brought up a bunch of like uh, their master ball melts. There's you know a bunch of these random companies, frosty, like there's, there's a bunch of random companies, you know? Um, but getting back to what was been intriguing, I, you know, uh, any shit from uh, Chris, you know, uh, over at archive, damn it, Bobby, like uh, it's pretty much anything that those guys drop. Everything. That's- is just fuck like man that team is stupid like it's that, crazy dude it's, <laughs> the, the the entry that or would not even an entry but the half gram that he put into the the hash calendar the 710 hash calendar the one that's out right now yeah. it was uh gee like right when i ripped that thing open i was like Whoop. that was like the first thing that i just fucking faced the whole entire thing because it's just his shit's so fucking tasty man and and they're they're killing it up there. Like they're just they're breeding for hash. They're hey bro, they're, they're doing so much shit. Inspirations for us, man. Like I, I, you know, like I've been friends with uh, Chris before he was working with Archive, and like to see the what he's done with those guys, and just the the it's it's been cool, man. Like so, it's mm-hmm. it's been very inspiring to see their their brand kind of grab a hold of Oregon's rec market out there as far as hash goes. You know, like. They're, what does their stuff go for in the in the shops? Uh, so I know they bounce around there for a minute. They were only selling at Archive. Uh, but now I know that they do kind of do drops in other stores. So I think it kind of varies depending on the store. But it's, you know, $80 a gram. You know, their full melt's $100 a gram. Oh, yeah. Damn, baby boy. Oh yeah, they, they got it. It's it's a good it's a good system they got going. They got it's it's in it's pretty much single source in house because of how Oregon's licensing is because they go from mm-hmm. Burnside Collective to that. So it's it's a yeah. it's such a smart a smart setup, you know. Like it's yeah, like I said, it's inspirational. Like it's just well, they're breeding too and selling seed, and that's kind of like what's so cool about it. But you know, like you said, it's this it's this little closed system that they have their cells because of the way the laws are, but they're able to just fucking geek out, dude. Like yeah. there's, sh- and then, and, and the other, the other great part is that he's so clever. He'll fucking murk you on Instagram too. Like he doesn't fuck around. Like he's, he's very articulate, very smart. So it's, it's a, it's a cool ass group of dudes. I've, I've had my uh, brushes with them and, and I'm stoked that they're at legends and I just confirmed that they will be at legends this year too. So yeah. No, no, yeah, no. He's honestly Chris, and that like I don't know much of the other guys. I just know Chris, damn it, Bobby. Like uh, he's been a good homie of mine for Chris the, is awesome, past, dude. Past few years, he's a great dude. Like, like just like I said, to see what they've done and what he's done with that brand, you know what he's what he's influenced, you know, with the hash and stuff. It's it's been kind of crazy to see. I'm like, it's 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 fucking dope, you know. I'm like this. What what a privileged position to be in too to have well, it. He went went from scored so, went, so crazy he went from scored which was a 502 in washington and not like i wouldn't say it's not like a a b brand or anything but it's not like your your most desired brand you know so 
and they just weren't seeing his vision with the hash stuff, you know? So to see from him go from that to picking up a job that was all about what he was seeing and what he wanted to do was like, that was perfect for him. Dude. Like the, the bet, like that relationship was like Cinderella putting the, the fucking slipper on, you know, like it's, well, he deserves it too. Cause he makes such good fucking product. Like, and that's the thing, like when you hear the word privilege, people sometimes think it's like a negative uh, connotation, but it's like with him, it's really like, he's earned that privilege. You could tell that he does he's cool such ass. a fucking great job with it, that it's insane. Yeah, he's a cool ass cat. That, that he deserves like that, like them like the the strains they're producing. You know, like that like as a team, like to line him up. Like I remember when he started there, like they had like something stupid, like a million fresh frozen grams ready for him to start with. Or so you know, so like you know, Jesus he's, Christ, he's got the you know they're they're you know, just ready to go. You know, so it's pretty it's pretty cool to see them what they've produced like everything they put in that store in those jars is awesome like I, like if i have to go to a store like that's what i go to like I, you know i have a, a buddies that work at a couple other stores that will hook me up with stuff but like me personally spending my money i, I go to archive you know if i if i'm gonna yeah. you know especially their flower like the, the who they carry as far as like organ growers go and like all mm -hmm. the best you know no they're they're really um they're definitely one of the one of the favorites. Is that we were talking? We were talking about favorite brands, right? Like no, he said that he likes. my favorite stuff that I've tried this year. Genetics. Okay. So I, I wanted to ask what you're currently running in your stable. Like, do you have any mainstays, and do you have stuff that that you're currently going through? Or, or yeah, so like? we uh, we definitely we go through shit all the time. Uh, we have some new ones that we're working on right now. The Armorello. Uh, we have a papaya fino because up here, uh, papaya is not really prominent like we don't have everyone like in california like that's you know like gmo to people in california up here it's really not you know like so uh, especially in oregon and in washington like it's really not that popular you know there's not a whole lot of people growing like real deal papaya and washing it so we're really excited about those two the armorello i'm really excited because i got to smoke some of that at legends uh and that was fuck ah, man that shit's really good so we're excited about those two for sure coming up um we have some that we really like already like the the three pooties um that's like been <sighs> iconic uh that's we entered a mix wash of that and rainbow belts in for legends um and yep. three pooties is i think that's kind of like our right now our staple like standout strain like uh, as far as like if i wanted to give somebody something that represented us hey, there you go there you go <laughs> what is the cross on that so it's, I recently, he put, it's funny, he, it's just like some woke shit he had written. Uh, it was Papaya Tropicana, and what they put was T3. But he ended up telling me, in D, like we were talking in the DMs, and he said that it's uh, Chem 3 is the is what the T3 stands for. So it's Papaya cross to Tropicana cross to Chem 3. And they called it three pooties because he would put three seeds in a fucking uh like a little seed jar you know a little little red disc the little red disc that they fucking use with the foam and that's what he was giving out and at three seeds yeah you got a chance you know type shit and we got lucky you know like uh i would say two, we could have kept both finos that uh we ended up with but what the one's just a standout it's it grows very very well uh super great structure you know big tower colas uh so the yield as far as plant is there and then yield as far as hash is there too. It does on a good, uh, you know, a good grow, it, the grows dialed and it, it, it will hit, you know, close to 5%, you know? So like, it's, it's not the biggest dumper we have or have seen, but the flavor is so unique that like, you know, when someone's smoking it, like you blow it out in the air and it's like this crazy, just tropical, like gassy papaya smell. Like it's, it's what it kind of reminds you like forbidden fruit when someone's smoking it, you know, like in there, like you just know it, like you're like, oh, what is that? Like, you know, like you can kind of, you, you tuck yeah. up, a little bit, you know, like, so for us, like that's a standout, like the, the three pooties is a, is a big standout for us. Uh, um, you know, we're running straw guava. Uh, we run a lot of archive stuff, Dosey Dose 55, uh, Moombo, uh, Rainbow Belts, uh, fuck man we're running a bunch of the uh, little lake valley seacoast stuff right now nice. too uh so we're kind of, like, 
everyone's just kind of like like my team like as far as like what grows producing what we're all we're always popping stuff man like i have like a little sports binder full of cards like you keep like like your cards and shit. i have that full of seeds bro just like so from every breeder like every so my my thing that i did be like while i was starting this brand was i'd go to all the events all the expos and that's kind of what i did was just meet breeders and i'd buy seeds and just kind of soaked up game for years the last few years that's what i was doing i spent a lot of money traveling doing that and just kind of like building our seed stock and it's luckily it's paying off now man because like seeing the futures sometimes is hard you know like it's you know like having uh going all in on stuff like that like i said i ain't afraid to be broke so like having a bunch of seeds just hanging out like it, it ain't shit to me you know like I'll, it, I'll do it again you know so like it's it, it it's cool because now it's those things are being used it's not just they're not just hanging out now it's we flip through these fucking pages and we grab seeds all the time yeah. you know and it's that that's what's cool you know so like yeah. Yeah, like working through the uh flavors from different breeders is is i think one of the funnest things in canada right now not being a breeder ourselves like we're gonna breed in the feet like, like that's down the road you know we definitely have ambitions for that yeah um, but not you know not being a breeder ourselves it's really cool to see everyone's projects you know like you know i i have a lot of old projects that we pop sometimes which is i think we're we were talking about earlier how cannabis is kind of circling back you know like i have a lot of old projects that we've been going through like we just washed a blueberry train wreck uh which you know it's that old haze like blueberry terps you know so like we have a lot of old stuff that we're kind of like also excited about because we grew up on it you know like we grew up on old stuff like I'm, I'm i'm on the younger cusp of all the you know the older guys but like i grew up with all the all the old shit all the ogs you know so like it's i'm right you know like all the old strains i grew up with it's just it's it's different because you know when you start just grow and you start your brand and shit like all that stuff got thrown out the window like a lot of the the chem and a lot of that shit the old yeah. sour that shit got thrown out the hazes and shit like like our area was predominantly like a lemon haze town like they grew hella super lemon haze here so i can't stand that shit that super hard limonene turp i we won't even do like if we wash it it's for the people like i don't that's not for me <laughs> you know, it's not for like you know so like it's it, like uh i think that there's like things that are it's cool that we can kind of circle back in cannabis to some of these things we grew up with right now you know and and seeds are the via the ability you know like, you know, the seeds have been giving us that ability to kind of uh, uh, time travel 10, 20 years, you know. Out of any of those cultivars that you mentioned, are there any that specifically stand out as better as a fresh press or better as a jam than they would be as a cold cure? Definitely. Um, I, and I think that's kind of where it results to is uh, fresh press and cold cure or heat all of that is strain dependent, you know, and I think that's where consumers or hashers are widely mistaken of what they're producing or putting out there, what, why they hate it, you know, uh, like we were talking about, like earlier, there's a lot of strains that I wouldn't feel comfortable stability wise for fresh press, you know, like they're just going to usually, you know, so I would definitely go cold cure, uh, I guess especially maybe more jam for sure. Like is the question, like, that jam, you know, yeah for jam like i think a lot of people overheat like if, if we're talking like heat tech jam right yeah so i think a lot of people overheat and we get one-sided terps you get this kind of one-sided flavor because i think that's more or less what gets like i'm i'm just kind of spitballing here i think that like one set of that terp is what is exposed and that's what we taste because if you it doesn't matter what run if you smoke someone's heat tech that was overheated it's kind of what you taste right at the beginning it's it's like this weird kind of terp that's like right there you kind of know that it's been heated up you know so i think that i've tried some that are great you know that have been done right i've done some that have been done right me personally i don't heat anything up unless it's for the vape pens you know or filling the pods up and shit you know uh I'm, I don't make, I, none of our jars get touched with heat. Like that's not our, our style. Uh, everything's at cold to room temp, maximum temperature. Uh, it, but strain wise, I think you can play with that so hard and find, find your balance of what is better than the other a hundred percent, because 
like I, from my experience R&D wise I've seen that you know just between cold curing and fresh presses and heat techs you know there's yeah. some things that when you did heat them up they don't really lose terpenes they kind of get louder you know yeah. and you can you know, I tried some from a guy uh cold gold I think it's their brand uh, the Addison there and that's all yeah cold cold gold extracts yeah yeah, that's like really all they do is heat tech stuff is a lot of jams and stuff. And he seems to have gotten a, a, a pretty good tech down. Like his stuff didn't taste super like monoturpin or like weird, you know. No, like, it wasn't all blown out. Yeah, you know, so like I think like there's there's such a fine line of adding too much heat with some of those strains that like where you get that weird flavor. Um yeah. but for jam, like for for me personally, uh I would much rather have a fresh press over a heat tech jam. You know, just because I it's not hasn't been altered, you know, um, and 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 vice like if we're if we're getting onto the topic of fresh press and cold cure, like that is, uh, you know, like some strains taste so so uh, strong fresh that they kind of need that cold cure to mature out, you know. So for me, like to smoke them, I kind of, uh, I, if I know what it tastes like fresh, you know, and I enjoy that, I'll go after the fresh press, you know, more or less than something that's been altered, you know yeah absolutely I, I wanted to ask you about legends i know we've kind of like touched on it and alluded to it but i wanted to kind of ask what your overall experience was of that event i know you've, you're very well traveled you've been to other events you've been to ego what was what was your experience at legends like uh so dude legends was uh was an experience, man. Like, so like for us, like we traveled pretty far, like, you know, we, we traveled uh, fuck, almost 20 hours to get there, you know? So we drive and, uh, it was cool to see a lot of these guys that like I talked to and shit that I haven't got to see in a while or I had never saw, you know? So that was a cool experience for us. And to smoke their hash was, you know, an even cooler experience. We got to sit there and fucking hang out and shit, you know? So, I really enjoyed it. You know, like I, we, like me and my partner, Andrew, that I brought down, like we enjoyed the shit out of it. We had a blast. Uh, I would say I'd want it to be longer, you know, <laughs> like that was our biggest <laughs> issue was like, if it could have been, uh, you know, longer, like I don't even say two, like if it was two days, dope, but like even just longer of one day, I would have loved it. And a little bit more space because we got so much shit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was, it was, we've, you know, what's cool about it is we've, uh, we've been able to like fix a lot of things for this year's. So it'll be, that's why we wanted to have all the same makers back plus another 10 makers for like 35 makers total. So it's, oh. so, and it's two day now. I think everybody loved it. It's two days now. Yeah. Now it's, so it's going to be dinner, you yeah. have dinner and you'll get your kit and you'll do some judging and then you leave and then you come back the next day for brunch and then it's out di outside sitting you, know, you could sit outside or inside or have much larger with booths like for that. each of the makers. I think like uh, the the coolness for us, like the like what I saw personally was the ability to to actually sit down and talk to fellow hashers about the game. You know, like what's going on in this this market and what's what all this shit is. You know, so we didn't have enough time or like the you know like the space to kind of move around as much as. We some of us have liked you know but i think that everybody was so geeked bro that it was just like it was fun it was, yeah. it was fun man like that like so two days i think two days is perfect like to have two days of like being able to get around better you know and, yeah. and it, way way nicer because i think everybody i didn't see one person mad about that event like leaving you know like I, I, everybody was happy you know yeah it was it, i think it, we we also wished it had gone longer but we, you know, so there's a lot of things that we added now. So it'll, That's so it'll hard. be a little cooler. Well, in the first one in, in America and like, there's a lot of firsts, bro. Like it's, it's a hard, it's a, it's a hard parameters to go around, you know? I, I think for it being um, our first attempt and for us kind of trying to figure out as much as we had to figure out, I, I think it went really well. And, and then we were left with um, a few things that we were able to now adjust and open this thing up more and, and so it's like what we did was went back and looked once it once it was over we did a full con ops on the entire operation and like we so we sat down and, and like conceptually down. went went and looked at all of it every single piece and component and, and at that time we sat down and started to just make notes of like all right we would do this different so now it's like well you'll, have, you'll get dude you'll get to have your phone and your camera 
because we think it'll promote it better and, and put more info. And that's more of like just that match is more of what is going on right now. You can't tell someone they can't and, you know, and, and, and all these different things. And that's so there's that part where people will be able to have their phone. Um, we think that'll help. There's uh, the second day is a big part, too. So hey, now people, there's more time people, to judge. Bro, people people had two phones and were sneaking the other ones in. I thought that was hilarious. I was like, God, scandalous. Just so scandalous. They could, so they could get a photo. I was like, this is crazy. Well, that's the other part, too, is we, we realize that, like, you really can't keep people from doing it. So then you're just going to. So now you're like making criminals, you know? So it's like, ah, we don't want to do it. So for us, man, like I thought that was a cool part because it forced a lot of these people who are stuck on their phones to be vocal, you know? And I think a lot of the cannabis community is so, uh, they feel safe, so easy to hide behind their phone, you know? So a lot of people, if given the choice, will sit on their phone and hide and, and not be communicative and talk and shit, you know? So I think what you guys provided was perfect, you know, like that, uh, it, you know, like I, I enjoyed that a hundred percent. I thought that was one of the coolest parts, like being forcing people to be people is, is good. You know, that's not weird. You know, like yeah. what's, you know, like I, so I thought, I thought that was cool. You know, like, I think there needs to be more of, uh, 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 you know, like not forcing, but a more of a, a highlighting on uh, let's be actual humans. Let's be social. Like, let's, you know, you don't got to be so clicky. Go meet some people. Go, you know, like, and that was what was cool we, when we did Thanksgiving, you know, at your spot. Like, I got to meet people that I've never met before, bro. So yeah, that was fun. I, that's what I came there to do. I came there yeah. to network. I came there to meet people, you know. So, like, like, I think that is for the events. Like, I think to take away the clickiness as much as possible is huge because a lot yeah. of, a lot of these people know each other, bro. Like, so it's, you know, to, if, if you know each other, the it's human instinct to go where, you know, and to hang out where, you know, you know, so like mm -hmm. it, it, it gets a little odd, you know, like I sat at a table with Colt, the cold gold or yeah, cold gold and, uh, uh, gold country extracts. Uh, yep. and both of those guys were fucking awesome. Dude, like gold. I talk to those dudes all the time now, like gold country, yeah. they're the homies, you know? So like, I, awesome. I, I wouldn't have that ability without like, the phone being taken away and us being forced to hang out. <laughs> now, same with Burko. Like I didn't that, like was like that. Maybe we talked before, but like I talked to him decent amount on IG now. You know, so it's like yeah. You know, some of these cats like it was cool to like be able to actually chop it up with. You know, like Mad River. Yeah, man. man, now you got me wanting to fucking take the phones back. God damn it! Like what? <laughs> oh, I could care less about the phone. You got me going both ways. I'm not sure. No, I, I think you make a great point though because it it did put people in front of each other. And, yeah. and it was something that, you know, because like you said, people fucking snuck phones in anyway. There's videos that I saw that were posted up. So I think I, I think it's hard to not have a phone in an event now. I think it's either got to be incredibly controlled or it's got to be just let go. I, I don't know. I think you need you like a metal detector. To, yeah. To really, to really, real to really make sure. Pretty yeah. much. You're, you're going to like people are so stuck on these things for you know whatever it is whether it's work or social or just like you know they're just stuck man like you have the world at your fingertips so they're gonna jump on it well i i know for myself i definitely have to like be very aware of you know of, of all of it because it can be a bad thing but the, easy, the convenience of it's awesome it's easy to get lost in it like it's very very easy yeah. so i want to switch gears a little bit and i want to talk about glass um, okay. you, I know are very involved in that scene and I wanted to ask when that started. Man. So me and my, my homie, like my, like I said, my brother, Andrew, we, uh, we started a glass gallery oh, fuck, when was that? nine years ago, 10 years ago. Oh, so, uh, I, you know, fresh out of high school, besides hustling, just didn't really have a plan, was being an idiot, you know, just kind of went through my uh, experiencing phases, you know, I was, you know, fucking around doing, you know, random party drugs and shit and like, was done with it, you know, like, just kind of phased out and was like, uh, I gotta, gotta grow up and start doing something, you know, so I remember we were sitting at the house and... I literally looked at him and told him like, yo, bro, we should sell glass. Like I, I can sell it. I had always been buying glass. Like I remember when I was fuck 17, I was paying people to go to the head shops here in town to, to get me random shit. 
Like, hey, go in there, grab me a few pipes. I give him a hundred bucks, grab, you know, grab me like three or four spoon pipes, you know, or a bong or whatever the fuck it was. And as soon as I turned 18, I go into the stores myself and I'd buy two, three bongs, you know, like, uh, I, fuck, dude, I was, I had a crazy thing happen to me where I had uh, the cops come to my house when I was like 18 and I had like 20, 30 bongs in the house and they called it the bong shrine. Like they're radioing back on the fucking radio and they're like, hey, we have the bong shrine and my parents being old school stoners and shit where they, you know, my dad's listening to the scanner and he was telling me about it after the cops had left my house. And he was like, yo, they're calling your house the bong shrine. <laughs> you know, and he's like, tripping, you know, so glass was always a fundamental of my smoking stuff. You know, my, my dad had a pretty good size, uh, glass collection, you know, even being homeless and like traveling. Like I remember like they had a box full of random cool ass pipes and shit. Like one looked like a dagger and like just cool shit, you know, like mm -hmm. you know, when they got their shit together, they had all sorts of random glass, you know? So I, glass has always been like a, a foundation for my smoking, you know? So, uh, I, I started collecting early and then we started that gallery at like, I was 19 or 20, 20 years old. Um, started the gallery we actually started it's called the smoke house and we started it in a an actual house uh that was commercial uh, mixed property it was commercial residential mixed property oh, cool. and it was a few blocks away from our high school that we graduated from so <laughs> i literally still had you know a little bit of the roots that i still had in high school you know from just graduating a couple years prior to sell to all these kids that were turning 18 years old or not 18 years old you know that were right there so <laughs> we re literally turned the neighborhood upside down with selling uh, a ridge. My, my original plan was just to sell glass. And I met a guy named infinity Glassworks, who was like, you're, you're going to have the worst time fitting into this scene selling Chinese import glass. So like our, like that was my introduction to like American made glass was this one dude. We found him on Craigslist. And he's now he's like one of my best friends. He's an awesome guy. He's fucking it's such it's so crazy. We met him at Starbucks. He blew our minds about glass and we started buying American made glass right then and there. Like I started buying local. I started looking up all the artists and that's how I like, got into the scene. I got into the glass scene because one man just told me like, yo, bro, you're going to have a hard time. You're in the Pacific Northwest. People do not want to import glass. There's tons of glass artists. He's like, you mm -hmm. could sleep a rock and hit five. I did not know that. You know, I had not the slightest clue that's how it was, you know? So, uh, I You're like sitting, sitting in the Mecca Medina of fucking glass blowers, like. Yeah, you know, so I think for us, like starting the, the glass gallery originally was just about money. And, uh, you know, and that's all it really strictly was about is we were smokers that I knew, I knew I could sell glass, you know, I had a passion for glass, but it was about money. And then when I like sat with this dude and like, as I started buying local glass and I started experiencing more shit, it just changed. Like flat out changed. Like it, you know, I got into the scene. I met tons of artists that became my friends. Like this is a piece that I'm hitting right here. Is an oh, let me get it in the center here. Uh, it's an Ambrose, and uh, that's a local guy. It's like one of my really good homies. I got another one right here. And that's pretty much who all I collect now. Like I have tons of glass. Like I have, you know, tons of shit for the the store still and everything. But as like collecting went on, like I just kind of stuck with what, uh, what what I like more and like what made sense to give people money. Glasses, glass mm -hmm. industry is huge. So if you pay the wrong people's pockets, you know, it's it's pretty easy to do. You know. Do you still have the same passion for it that you do that you did then today? Is it still something? Else? I don't have the same passion to like run the store and stuff. I would say as I did before. Like I love, I used to love doing that shit. It was fun. Um, the scene here has died, so that's a big reason why that passion has gone. Um, and then two, the scene period with glass has gotten different. You know, so. My my glass passion will never go away. I'm always gonna have glass. I'm always gonna enjoy it. I'm always gonna know the, the artists, and I'm always gonna have passion for it. You know, so that's not gonna go away. Uh, I think my urge to buy glass all the time has gone away. You know, like I don't have the urge to to like at DFO. Like I bought a forty dollar carb cap, bro. Like, and it looked like a 
one of the little Mario bombers, you know, like from, from mm-hmm. Mario or whatever, you know. And the, the only reason why I bought it was because it was cool. I, me and my girlfriend laughed about it. I was like, this is pretty tight, you know. So I grabbed that, you know. I think I got her a pendant too. But besides that, like I really – I don't, I don't do what I used to do. I'd go to DFO and just buy a glass, you know, especially for the store. I would just buy it, you know? So like, um, I think the, the, the passion has settled more into like, a, uh, uh, I couldn't even say a collector cause I don't even collect like that anymore. So I would just say like, uh, I still got love for it, you know? Yeah. Understanding and love, you know, like it's just hard. Glass is a hard one, man. At, at, it's a at, way of life like yeah, to be a yeah. heady boy is a way of life it's really it takes a lot of commitment yeah well, yeah. the scene's just weird with those with a lot of the, the 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 heady boys it's just you know a lot of them are, are are growing up at a weird rate and they have such exposable income that they don't realize it you know so like yeah. they come off pompous or they come off nice one time and then vice versa they're pompous the next time so it's a weird yeah. world yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a weird one. So glass for me, you know, over time I've just the scene's gotten different, so I've just kind of changed it, you know. Yeah. Who were uh, who were the artists that you were collecting when you were buying pieces? Oh shit, uh, man! Everybody, I've bought all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, Doc glass, uh, Ambrose glass is like a big one I collect. Uh, I'll lay them off a bunch of the locals that I've collected here. Brando. Uh, OG Badger Glass, Domer Glass, uh, Bowman Glass, a bunch of those guys. Uh, I have like stuff from like the Team Japan artists and stuff like that, like uh, Yoshi and those guys. Uh, I got uh, Combo, uh, Royal, a uh, bunch of Rain and Royal stuff. He's a local friend of ours. Like he's he's a local guy, really cool guy too. Um, JD, um, yeah, you know, there's, I, I could keep going. I don't even know. There's so much class, bro. I have so much. Class. If I showed you my table, I just took a, a display down in our house. Uh, my glass, like a lot of my collection is literally all over my uh, countertops right now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere. I have, like my countertops are completely took <laughs> and my girlfriend hates it. She's like, what the fuck? And do you what? guys still have the shop now? No, so I had a shop with Kung Fu Vapes, and uh, we were doing a collab store in downtown of downtown Spokane. And I just didn't really uh, come out on top with the scenario, and I didn't with uh, with COVID and stuff. You know, it just didn't make sense. You know, rent and everything, and this, like I said, the scenes here is just dying. So I I just kind of like closed it and was just doing the Instagram thing and it got to another point where I was just mentally like, I'm just rather focused on Tryptopia, you know, like it's, does it make sense to do something that is I'm just dragging dead weight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, burden, in a sense, yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. So if I redo it, it's going to be something that can run itself. It's going to be small. It's going to run itself. It's going to be a small self-sustaining gallery that of the rest of the shit that I have that I've collected and I have, you know, uh, and kind of just maintain it off of what the local guys got to do, you know, because I have love for the local scene. I, I got a lot of love for this local scene. Um, they just, it's just different. The glass scene is different. Like, he, he, like here, it was all about like local people. And then it blew up into who you could buy online. And they were late to the party. So it just killed all the stores because all the stores geared up to, you know, fill their stores full of shit, you know, because they were doing great. And now all the collectors just buy shit online. So it was just, you know, well, the a, store, the stores can sell online, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it's got to adapt, you know. Yeah. They didn't adapt hard enough because a lot of the I would say the artists here sold directly to, to collectors. And that's where they also fucked themselves because it was a race to the bottom. You sell the collector, mm-hmm. then you got to sell it cheaper, and then the stores aren't buying from you, so then you're selling yeah. glass. So it was just like a uh, a really, really good scene because we had a, you've heard of Peace of Mind, obviously, probably. Oh, yeah. 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 So Justin's from this city, from Spokane, and he, he, like, he ran the glass scene, you know? So to have my – I had a small gallery that took a decent chunk of the pie from them in another gallery called Puffin Glass – 
and Puffin Glass actually sold their entire collection to uh, Hitman Dougie. And so it, it was uh, like all those banjos, the R2-D2 piece and the helmets and all that. That was all yeah. originally in my city. <clears throat> So the city here did great for glass for a long time. It was a glass mecca. You know, all the guys came through here. Uh, Quave, Quave used to hang out and blow glass here. Elbow, all the guys that came through here. Um, it, it was a mecca, you know, so it did great. And then it died and it's just kind of stayed stagnant, you know. So I think that's that's kind of where glass went, you know. Yeah. It's, 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 on, it's online now, you know. It's like Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. The shops are, I mean, the shops are banging. That's what's weird, though. I think it's just like when you, when you see a shop that's successful now, they're selling online. They have great relationships with the blowers. They know how to throw events in, in shop. And if they're in a state where cannabis is legal, like we go in California to the shows, and it's like everyone's just dabbing in the shop. It's like, woo, like it's the best experience. You know, it's super nice. So I think in those places – where it has a better environment they're, they're doing pretty good from what i see but that, i'm i'm talking california so and i'm not sure if you're familiar with 50 second glass shop but yeah. like yeah 50 second up in washington yeah like he came in and decimated the glass scene period because a lot of what people were doing was selling pieces at a very inflated price and so when he came in and was buying pieces and selling for what he got them for it kind of changed the game because no one had done that tactic yet where they had taken over a market and got popularity and got friends by just selling glass. You know, he didn't need the money and by no means did that man need, you know, so. Was that, did Kobe own 50 second? Uh, so, uh, there's the, it's actually like an old backing. They, they own Sam's smoke shop, which is like one of the biggest, like uh chain of smoke shop stores, like in the country and, they, sure. and they're connected to a butane factory. So they, wow. yeah, their money's long. They don't need anything to do with glass. His, he, so the, uh, the uncle, he let his nephew pretty much spend money and started take half of his smoke shop and turn it into a gallery. And that's 50 second glass shop in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, they did. <clears throat> they do a lot of mothership, right? They do a lot of everything, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's kind of crazy. You, you, It's just a little sh- strip in the middle of fucking nothing. And they got oh. tons of cases full of glass. Yeah, well, that's where you go. If you're, if you're looking for some headies. <laughs> oh yeah. If you're looking for a deal and you wanted something that's, and that's what I'm saying. Like, like a store like that really, really hurt like Washington, but just the glass market as a whole, because glass artists, one were like, yo, you just sold that piece for like what I gave it to you for. And they didn't, you know, they're, they're tripping because they're collectors that want their shit wanted for that price now, you know? So it's, well, what, but the thing, what I'm wondering though, is like that model can't work for that long because you're going to burn so many of the blowers. Then, uh, where yeah. you... oh, because some of the blowers didn't care. They're just like, yo, if you're going to cash me out every time, I'm getting cashed out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I guess. I mean, that's when would sometimes when things are less sophisticated. It's because some kind of get to that place, but don't make a hundred pieces a year. They make twenty pieces a year. So if you can sell the one to me, you know, and sell to another gallery, your 20 pieces and they're all sold. Fuck it. Forget about it. You're going to sell it to that guy. Yeah. You're going to get them out there. I mean, that's, you know, and there's, there's always going to be somebody who has just money and they don't see it. You know, it, I mean, everybody's done it. Like you sold a piece and, and you, you know, lost money on it or whatever. So hundreds, bro, I've done it hundreds of times. Like, oh, man. Yeah. or like you just kind of like, for me, like having the store and selling something for cost or for less than what I got it for just to get it out was one to get it away, you know, and get it sold was to just keep new product going. But two was to see someone just get happy with it, dude. Like to yeah, see you can stoke like, somebody out. Dude, they can be see, see someone like actually genuinely stoked with it and I don't have to look at it no more. And I'm like, tight, cool. It's the things. Are- well, then you have money now to, to buy something else, you know, flip something yeah, else. Model, keep, 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 keep things pushing, man. Always keep it pushing. Like, you know, like if you, if you're stagnant, you got to keep it pushing, man. Like in that, with glass, I, a lot of artists don't realize that they, they'll stay on one design or they'll beat the dead horse of that one piece that they've been trying to sell for two months. And then people don't want it, you know, mm. got to keep it pushing. 100%. So 
in addition to the glass community, the cannabis community is also in a pretty rough spot right now, both on the traditional and regulated market side. Are, what is your outlook for the next three years? Are you optimistic? Do you, what, what do you see happening? I would tell people to buckle up because it's definitely going to get a little weird. You know, uh, if you're not going through and trying to do new things as far as strains go, what you're producing quality wise, whatever, it's going to be hard for you, you know? And if you don't stay in your own lane and do too much, it's also going to be hard for you, you know, in the next few years. And I think that's why I, you know, getting back to of just like, we try not to bite off too much that we can chew and we just try and stay in our own little lane and our own class. Like, you know, uh, and that's what I'm going to stick with, you know, uh, maybe we'll expand, you know, and try and hit one of these, these rec opportunities eventually, you know, if we have to in the next couple of years, you know, but for us, you know, uh, we're just going to keep it small and keep things, you know, boutique, you know, cause that's, that's where I think it's headed. You know, if you're not a boutique brand that has, things to offer that people genuinely want and you have a genuine following that's not paid or, or fake it's going to be hard for you you know like like that organic following is everything in this market uh, look at wineries you know breweries all that like there's people who drink shitty beers but they love it you know and that they're gonna love it you know so as long as you get uh some sort of following that that loves you and you stay with it and you stay with it you know and you keep providing them something that they like you, you'll be fine in the next three years i think it's if you don't have that following that you can provide things to you're not going to be fine in three years you know do you see value in looking to partner with groups on the regulated side or do you feel as though your brand will have more value if you hold fast and, and wait some time before so this is those doors. Battled with, bro. This is one that I, you know, it's everyday battle. And I've seen companies that were doing great beforehand that turned to hate life and really struggle and not do well. And I've seen some that were not doing so well that went wreck do great and i've seen some that were doing great before do great after so it's it for me i'm just i gotta find the right deal that makes sense you know for for my team you know like i, I it's not just me you know so like it, it's i gotta make sure my homies they're all good like you know if we go into something we're gonna make sure that like i, I gotta bring the team with you know like i'm not i'm not gonna go into a deal that is blind to just sell our name you know like that that's that's the thing like i'm not not doing that, you know, so if where I find value is uh, just that that safety of the license, man, you know, like if we can find somebody that meshes our goals and meshes our future and shit and they they, they want to license up with us and give us that ability, that's where I, I find the comfort with it of doing it. But for right now, it's just it, it's just so hard. A lot of vultures out there, you know, they see something they want and they, they want to take off more than than what i have of it you know 100 percent, 100 percent. um uh if you had to name one person who was like who assisted you in leveling up your your saltless acumen you know was there was there one individual or person that that really helped you learn or were, were you all self-taught um i would say it was a lot like definitely local uh that to help me learn you know like it was my homie joe he helped me a lot he's helped me a lot learn the, the solving this route you know uh but as far as like in internet goes uh and like paying attention and like seeing people do things uh i'd have to say like ken wall like 100 percent. like it, without like watching his shit to a t uh there th he's definitely helped me out a lot you know Cuban, like uh, both of those guys, like just watching what they did and trying to emulate like what they did. Like Cuban was out in Washington for a while. So I got to have that like little bit of a relationship of talking with him, you know, and shit like that. So it's, you know, like those guys definitely as a whole, like all three of those names I mentioned definitely helped me with the, my solvent list inspiration and this brand. So 
when people ask you about getting into the cannabis industry, what advice do you give them? Do you, do you tell them to come in or do you, do you tell them to maybe seek, seek employment elsewhere? I would depend on what they're trying to do. You know, like if you, where I'm at, like I said, 502, I would tell them to stay the fuck away. <laughs> you know, it, it is not, you know, and I might get flack for this, you know, but I, I have not met too many people in Washington state's legal system, 502, that are having fun. There's really not a whole lot of them. Like in every brand that I've seen has been spitting out or they're just kind of floating, you know? So it's, uh, that being said, the consumers that come in aren't that educated. They're not uh, after the most desired like products like we enjoy, you know, like we want the best products that we can usually smoke. I doubt we're going in there asking for $20 ounces of flour and shit, you know, so dealing with that, it would be hard. So like telling someone to like, Hey, you want to go work at a rec store in Washington? I probably wouldn't tell them that, you know, if they're super uh, retail oriented, you know, server oriented style like that, yeah, go ahead. You'll have, you might enjoy it, you know, what, you know, at a faster paced store, a slower paced store, you might fucking hang yourself. You know, like, you know, you're not doing nothing, but maybe counting inventory if they even let you do that. You're just kind of hanging out, you know, so and then it goes into like, are you going to go be a trimmer or what are you going to go water plants? You know, like this. What are you going to do in the cannabis industry? So it'd be hard for me to like, you know, if I were to tell them about the 502 side of like, yeah, go sign up and be, you know, have a job. But like if you're genuinely wanting to know and wanting to get into it in any shape or form, I would say go go for it. You know, like cannabis is awesome. You shouldn't be afraid to try it at all. You shouldn't be afraid to do anything, you know, but be careful if you have money and you're going into it and trying to invest and shit like that. You know, it's, there's a lot of people spending blind money in this in this game, you know, and I think that is uh people don't really talk about that because there's a lot of people that are taking advantage of these sheep that are coming in and they're just, they're letting them spend it up, you know? So like, and Mm -hmm. they're spending it up with them, you know? And that's what it comes to. It's like the licensing shit, you know, like you could, you know, I could take someone's money right away. You know, I'm not doing that shit. You know, like that's, I'm not going to spend someone's money. Like I fuck all that. Uh, I think that, if you were to get into the cannabis game, you better already have a passion. You know, you better not try and just learn this shit. You know, it, it's not at that point anymore. It's it's so uh, consumer oriented. It's not uh, it's not like a teaching game anymore as much. You know, like before we were kind of taught it. You kind of were just brought up with it. You know, like it was like a teaching. It was part of your life. You know, mm-hmm. it's not really part of your life as much anymore. You know. Like, especially if you're in a legal state, like you're, you're turning a certain age waiting to go smoke like that. We didn't have that. Like, fuck. <laughs> like, wait no. till you're, you know, like that, that. So I think it's just different. Yeah. For sure, man. I think that, I think that's, I think that's sound advice. What in the last five years, like what is one thing that you champion as being your proudest moment? Like whether it be like a cup win or, mastering a wash or completing a harvest like what what would that be i would say just dialing in our our process you know dialing in our washroom dialing in what we do uh just getting to the point where we're at now you know as a company you know like there's a lot of growing pains a lot of shit like that like i'm really just proud of where it what it's turned into you know like in the last uh, you know five years you know like it's I started this brand in 2017. So, you know, it's, it, it's been five years, you know, pretty much for the most part on the cusp of like six, you know, but uh, I would definitely say just being proud of where we're at now, you know, like I'm proud that we got offers to go to legends and shit like that. Like, you know, like there's not everybody who got that, like, you know, like that, that's, that's a pretty cool thing, you know, like, uh, so I, I'm just kind of, I'm more or less just proud of like being able to to build something with a following that's organic. Like I was saying, like, if you have people that actually want to fuck with you, you'll know it, you know? And like, that's a pretty cool thing. Like I have people who actually fuck with me. Like I have people who hit me up on the regular and want to hang out or want this hash, or want, you know, to know what's going on with this brand, you yeah. know, like a pretty cool thing. Uh, probably one of the other cool ones we sold, uh, I did a mood map lab years ago like right when mood mats were getting super popping three four years ago and we sold the fastest amount of mood mats that they had ever seen it was 100 mood mats in like 55 minutes you know whatever the fuck it was 53 minutes or whatever on their website you know so like that that was pretty cool that's awesome 
That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Were you yeah. a huge fan of Tur uh, of uh, Utopia? Utopia, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's inspiration, bro. Everyone wants to know about it. That's the inspiration. So what I did is, uh, I definitely drank the fuck out of that as a kid. I was a fat. Yeah, kid. I did. I was a fat kid growing up, so I drank the shit out of fruit. Is it still around, or is it gone? Canada Coke product. I actually had uh, a guy who hit me up who works with them and was like, "Hey, man, like, cool product, you know, cool branding." He was like, "Just, you know, like." Cool that you guys changed it you know he was just let me know like I, I could have been sued if i didn't change some of the elements because when we first dropped it i still have the logo i didn't change any of the fruit all i did was <laughs> the font i or i didn't even change the font i just changed the text in the font and i that's what i ran with it was the same sh their same shit like and i fool i'm so lucky i didn't get like at least somewhat popular when we first were using that because they are a legally licensed coca-cola brand you know so yeah. we, we changed enough on it now um and it, that's where it came from you know like fruitopia expanded the limits of drinks of what they put into it uh they were the loudest fucking most exotic things around on the block you know so like that's where i was uh going with this you know like you want to be in terptopia when you smoke you know that that's the euphoric effect you want to feel you know yeah that's awesome I know I, lo I love the name. I mean, I grew up drinking it, so I, I think that's. that's you I see the shirt and they lose it. They're like, oh, don't, don't, they, they, you know, they don't even know what it is, but they know what it is. It's a, it's a, uh, that like, burns, uh, like Bernstein Bears effect moment. You know, like, you know, like yeah. they just, they, they know Mandala effect. You know, like. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, they know what it is, but they don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so what's 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 next? Like, what do you? What are you building towards this year? Like, what 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 do you got going on coming up? This year, um, next is we're dropping another website for our merch. Uh, I'm uh, partnered with this company called Merch Inc. That is, uh, a, I don't know how to explain it. They are local to Portland, Oregon, but they're not. They're based out of California, in essence. You know, they're they're base of operations. But uh, so we'll be doing a lot of merch with them. It's a good friend of mine, Alex, that I've just been kind of partnering up with, uh, just getting ready to do stuff with that. Because uh, the merch has been like a really sought after thing for us. Uh, as thankful as that is, you know, like the people want it. You know, I get hit up all the time. Can I get a sweatshirt? Can I get a mood mat? Can I get this? And we don't have it. Like I do limited runs. Like I don't have boxes and boxes of merch waiting around and inventory waiting around for people because one that's it's a very hard thing to do and two it it makes more sense to partner with people who are professionals with the merch i'm not a professional at uh keeping up with buying all this shit and doing all that like i just don't have the time like i've ran stores i know what it takes to to do all that so like teaming up with a company like merch inc to sell all this merch is it's been very very uh a breath of fresh air i'm really stoked on that you know moving forward and then just like as far as what we're doing as a team like we got a lot of flavors we're working on we're really stoked to kind of like narrow down a wider range menu um we're working on a pretty cool like turp box thing i don't want to put too much on it like we've done boxes in the fat like the past i did like a valentine's box i did a uh christmas box so we're gonna do something that's really really like clean and professional we're working with a company right now on it and it's gonna be a box that the first one will feature hash and and rosin and the second one will feature probably flour and edibles so it's gonna we're gonna kind of focus on some some cooler like niche products that uh will kind of open us up into other i think other markets as well you know like the the boxes will be able to you know have a little bit more fun with those of what we're putting in them and shit like that uh besides that we're just kind of looking forward to this you know the summer really like could be the summer being here like we like i said it's cold all the time where we are bro so the summer being here is awesome we're just trying to bounce through summer look towards winter bro and then uh keep popping flavors you know so like that's you know we're, we're about flavors that's what this company was started for was flavor yeah that's what we're we're, we're after we're just we're gonna keep building our menu keep getting longer um and just kind of look for like those opportunities like I was talking about. If one comes up that I feel comfortable with taking, that's kind of where I'm headed towards with this this company. You know, is 
coursing it the the boutique way you know I, i'm not selling out anytime soon i'm not going into some random market just to get a check like that doesn't make sense to me you know like i could have done that 20 times over like i do that tomorrow you know mm-hmm. like it just doesn't make sense you know so what makes sense to me is longevity you know like and that's oh, yeah. that's what i want you know so like just trying to trying to move in the smart way you know like like you were saying the 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 industry and the market is in a weird f- fringe right now you know so you gotta paddle correctly and figure out where you're going you know 100 percent, bro 100 percent. well max i appreciate you coming on i appreciate you taking the time bro of course bro of course i appreciate where can, uh where can people find you besides uh the instagram page uh right now it's pretty much just the instagram page like I, we stay pretty low key uh that's you know like if we want to get back to, to to a little bit of something on this company was started is like we stay safe. We try and be as safe as we can, you know? And so I like to tell people, uh, our hash finds you, you know, you, you, you know, that's the best way I could say, it. you know, like if you're looking for it, it will find you. I promise you. But you, you said you guys are going to have a website for the merch and stuff. Yeah. yeah merch will the merch and all that. You'll be able to get all that. I'll have it. It'll be most likely something super simple, triptopia.com or triptopia.us or something. I'll have it all. All that will be produced on, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Triptopia on Twitter, Triptopia on uh, Instagram. I have to keep fighting with those motherfuckers to keep my page alive. But you know. <laughs> good thing, good thing it's still there, man. That's awesome. Yeah, you know. But uh, f- to like to find us in the future, we'll be at any event that we can pull up on the West Coast for the most part. Like we don't, I don't travel east as much anymore. The mid, the mid, uh, the Midwest or any South or anything. But the West Coast, like that's this is our home. We try to hit everything we can. Yeah. You know? awesome. We'll right. see. We'll see you guys at Legends for sure. I'll see you at Legends. You know I'll be there. Absolutely. Thanks, well, thank you so much, bro. Again, thanks for taking the time. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you. Appreciate it, Max. Of course, bro. Peace.